Faith is a powerful force indeed, it is true. We have our own faith, not in one of our number raised to godhood, but in a mutual destiny that cannot be denied. Together, we shall inherit the stars, even if we must first cleanse them in blood. The Tau are a welcoming people. Their advanced culture incorporates dozens of alien races, all willing comrades in the pursuit of the greater good, the philosophy of unity and selflessness known as the Tauvar. There is no violence within these cities. For one member of Tau society to attack another is all but unheard of. Criminals and those who waste the lives of their fellows are simply exiled. The threat of banishment from the metropolis is punishment enough to ensure all participants strive for harmony. The Tau themselves are the benevolent guides and helpers of this culture. They are formed into groups, or castes, each with its own vital function within society. The Earth castes are the most numerous. They are the medics, builders, fabricators, and engineers of Tau society, forming the vital foundation of our culture. The water casts are our diplomats and ambassadors. They are often the first Tau to bring the way of the Tauvar to prospective allies. You may have seen them in the flesh already. The air casts are our pilots and messengers. We sometimes call them the invisible casts, for they are rarely seen. They prefer the low gravity of high orbit and thrive on the sensation of flying high. The fire casts are the honorable defenders of our way of life. When an outside factor threatens the greater good and the freedom it represents, these warriors are there to defeat it swiftly and efficiently. Their bravery is complemented by the best weapons technology in the galaxy. United, these four castes work under the Talvar's leaders, laboring ceaselessly alongside their allies to ensure the greater good provides the best quality of life. Our technology and habitation is free and readily available to all. Not just for the Tau, but for anyone who puts aside their troubles to join our vision of a healthy and happy society. You can be part of it. You will be part of it. Our destiny is to unite the stars. The wise man embraces it. He and his kin will reap the rewards for the rest of his life. The fool will fall by the wayside, cold and hungry. So, do you have a name? Oh, come now. I know you understand me. My servant Dorvis tells me you've been trying to convince him to release you for hours. Your command of our language is very impressive. What do you want with me? Simply to learn, my nameless friend. Forgive my incredulity. Your race has never struck us as interested in learning. <laughs> Mercifully, we aren't all alike. For example, Own, that's what your cast is called, yes? I should be delighted if you would tell me all that you know about the Tauvar. The Tauva. I dare say you think you already know all there is to know. Very well. If I am denied the company of my own people, I can, at least, represent their righteousness. The Tauva is the one true pathway. Where Guelas place your faith in a god that can affect your life not at all, the Tauva brings every Tau to contentment. But what is it? Selflessness, you would call it. The greater good. The knowledge that staring inwards one finds only solitude. But by staring outwards, by devoting oneself to the race and its quest for perfection, there is harmony and peace. An ongoing quest? So you admit your empire is not yet perfect? Of course not. What is? The Tauva is the path, Guela. 
not the destination. And you Greyskins all just agree to follow the same path. Is that so hard to believe? Why should we rail against that which makes the most sense? Each Tau is free to choose their destiny. That they all choose the Tauva is merely testament to its righteousness. It is a unifying ideal. Unifying? Ah, yes. I've heard that argument before. And what happens when you find someone who doesn't want to be unified? Eh? Subjugation. You missed the point. The greater good is no mere diversion. No empty godhood in which we place our faith. It is a necessity, human. It is the only thing that can save the galaxy from itself. We have a saying. Aurok shothri sukkon shatauva. Unity comes to all things in time. Whether they like it or not. All right. Another question. What do you know of Oshova? You think yourself cleverer than me, Guela, but I assure you... Evading my question isn't clever, Aun. Just a sign that I've hit a nerve. I ask you again, what do you know of Oshova? What do you know of Commander Farsight? Let me start you off. It's a story I heard from a trader at the edge of the Damocles Gulf. Seems this Oshova was a great hero of yours in the Firecast. Genius at whatever he did. Just so long as what he was doing was fighting. Isn't that how it is with you, Tao? Watercast to talk and debate, Aircast to shuttle you around, Earthcast to do the dirty work. Everyone with their niche. No interbreeding, no intermixing. So, Chova sets off to reclaim some colonies, and naturally, there's an ethereal in charge. Except, Leon gets killed, and Oshova ends up in command. Suddenly, there's no one reminding him about the bloody Talvor, and he's a long way from home. So what does he do? I mean, like you said, the Tauvor is something you choose to follow. Yes? Surely Oshova would have carried on with the peace and tranquility crap despite it all, Aun. Except he didn't. <laughs> he set up on his own. His very own little empire. Without you ethereals telling him what to do. Without your wretched Talvor running his life. You said it yourself, On. Why should we rail against that which makes most sense? Well, maybe it only makes sense whilst you lot are in charge. Wherever we have cast our gaze in this galaxy, we have seen only the dead and the dying, and those intent only upon casting themselves into burning pyres of their own making. That is why we shall ultimately prevail, for we are different. We are united. We are determined. And we cannot fail, but embrace the manifest destiny into which we are born. The greater good, the Tau Va, the manifest destiny of unity for all sentient life. The responsibility to work together and to ensure the greatest good for the greatest number. Why should we rail against that which makes most sense? Why did one who had assumed the hero's mantle turn his back upon the greater good? Shas O, Viola Shova, Kais Monter. High Commander of the Second Sphere of Expansion, Leader of the Firecast, the High Commander, Farsight. Once the greatest hero the Tau Empire had to offer, now a name expunged from the annals of Tau history. 
one whose academies and statues have been torn down as the memory of the traitor is suppressed. But who is Commander Farsight? How did the embodiment of Tao Pride become a source of its greatest shame? His story begins in the 41st millennium. Osho, born to the fire cast upon the Tao Sept world of Viola, the young Tao reflected the heat and ferocity of his volcanic home, the hot temperament of the Violans known to be greater than their fellow fire casts. Growing within the confines of the blooming empire of the Tao, the unifying philosophy was poured into his growing mind, the greater good, the Tao Val, the impediment to act with the best interest of the collective in mind. All Tao when sentient life were given the manifest destiny to create Utopia, a place of harmony and balance. It was born from the ashes of the Mon Tao, the death age millennia ago, a story that frightened the young children. With all the wonder of a child, the young Osho cowered in fear. The tale was retold of this age of darkness. Upon their homeworld of Tao, the various castes fought like primitives. The short and stout earth caste, the muscular and hot-tempered fire caste, the tall and light air caste, and the bureaucratic water caste. Divergent species that warred across the plains and deserts, of the temperate world of Tao. Violence, disease, and the struggle to survive in simple mud huts was the height of Tao existence, as all subspecies huddled around simple fires, afraid of the dark. A slow decline was the destiny for all Tao, until they arrived. Enlightenment, hope, guides to reach the dawn and lift the Tao from the darkness into a new, brighter age. The fifth caste, the Aun, the Ethereums. Fiotan, the siege of the infamous city had cost a mountain of blood. An alliance of fire caste plain dwellers, an air caste Tao laid siege to the mightiest fortress city of the earth caste builders. Nearly 7,000 beings dwelt within the great citadel, and in vain, all attempts at diplomacy have been brushed off by the ferocious plain dwellers. Death was the only outcome they desired, until, striding forth from the dust and darkness, like a moment of mythology itself, tall strangers approached the besiegers and the besieged. They were tall, their features serene, and their aura one of such placidity it was as if the flame of the warrior spirit was snuffed out before them. Both the plains warriors and the builders felt their pulses raise. The scrutiny of these ethereals was overwhelming, but yet they found that they craved it. They wanted to listen to them, to give what they could to help these strangers. Peace dawned as the philosophy of the greater good finally reached the ears of the plains and builder town. Unity, harmony, and prosperity all Tao underneath one banner, where the collective would work together in the role the greater good needed them to fulfill. From the plains to the skies, from the builders to the mountains, all of the Tao joined the ethereals, birthing the Tao Empire, a story the young Osho burned into his core as he learned of his role in the greater good and what it demanded from him. From the plains of Tao, now in the ranks of the fire cast, Osho would be the defender of the greater good, a warrior. It began in the training domes of Violas' capital city on Monteir. Physical regiments, education and indoctrination of the code of fire. The battle tome of the fire cast way of war was absorbed by the growing Osho. But the hot temperament ran even hotter in this Violan more than even his fellows, as an insatiable desire to learn consumed him. The desire to serve the greater good, and in his heart of hearts, his hunger for battle, where both beasts needed to be fed. He wasn't the strongest, or the fastest, nor even the biggest, but this young Tao was a cut above the rest. Knowledge being the tool that gave him the edge, 
The ability to not just react well, but to plan. To factor in more information into his strategies. Learning to predict his instructor's challenges, he would exude a brilliance that caught the eye of many. Some saw the rise of this young fire cast as troublesome. Shah Khan Thras, a voice among the few dissenters, who decried the unorthodox nature of Osho's thinking. Some instructors wishing to finally teach him a lesson, attempted sabotage, putting the young Osho into a near hopeless live fire war dome exercise. Osho was furious, but in their efforts to outwit the young startup, he proved himself, choosing to sacrifice his own life in the simulation for a teammate. A choice made in line with the greater good. More dissent came over his time in training, but it was all drowned out, as a chorus of praise reached even the ears of the one who wore the hero's mantle. The legendary Commander Pure Tide, master of the Kayun, Monat, and Montcar strategies. The mind that had birthed the very codes and teachings the Firecast took to war. The very sight of Commander Pure Tide filled Osho with awe, as if to be in his presence was a gift. He was the hero, and Osho would never admit how he used to draw him as a child. The young fire cast from Viola would be one this legend would look out for in the years to come. But war, the underlying path that rang hot in the Violans' blood, finally arrived as Osho joined his fellow fire cast upon the front lines of the expanding empire, finding himself under the command of another legend amongst the Tau, Commander Dawnstone. The Arakan, the spider-like Xenos had made the mistake of rejecting the greater good, drawing these two empires into a brutal conflict. The conflict within the catacombs of the Arakan's home was a horrifying experience for Osho. Blood and death surrounded him. Even his own leg was severed off by a disgusting mandible of this foul enemy. Conflict after conflict, he survived. He improved, even daring a Monat assassination against the ruling Arakan. And when duty called, Osho used his own body to shield Commander Dawnstone. The final act he was certain was his death. But Osho awoke, confused, disorientated, his body buzzing with the adrenaline of battle, only to find his commander staring down upon him. It wasn't real. His leg was never gone. It had all been a test, a simulation. But before his features could contort with anger and confusion, he was given answers. It had been a test like no other, because Osho was special. The instructors had seen it, seen that he was worthy to be challenged, a trial for the ultimate responsibility of the Tao Va, of what the greater good would ask of him, a chance to be at the side of a legend, Commander Pure Tide. He was overwhelmed. The responsibility, the excitement, the dread, all rushing over the young Tao as he was shipped to his new home, to Dalith, the corsept world Osho travelled, leaving Viola his home for the first time, and travelling to the stars. Upon the freezing slopes of Mount Kanji, Osho stared, and for the first time in his life, he saw snow an enigma to one born to the fiery wastes of his homeworld. To the summit he would have to travel. There awaited a trial unlike anything he had seen before. A test to see if he was worthy enough to become a pupil of Master Pure Tide. I no longer answer to that name. I have the rank of commander and you will address me accordingly. Oblatai merely raised his muscular shoulders a fraction, his broad face as impassive as a glacier. Commander Brightsword draws a reasonable conclusion, said Osho, putting an end to the matter before the young warrior's temper flared any further. Yet there remains another. You think these primitive ones capable of setting up a Kaoyon strategy? The Greenskins have a brutal cunning, I hear. Perhaps they let us approach unhindered in the hope of gaining a new opportunity. It is as Master Pure Tide taught us. Stepping over to his command throne and tapping a sequence, 
A plate-sized holographer drone rose silently from the throne's wide armrest. Proceed. Smoothly, a high-resolution hologram of a firecast officer resolved within the commune bay. He was tall, upright, and clad in full formal dress. From his domed head, a long top knot was banded with many honorific rings. His posture was upright as a battlesuit at an ethereal's grand arrival. Greetings, Shaz Ovasia Astos. We look forward to fighting alongside you. Please, simply call me Shavastos. I am not worthy of the rank of commander, not whilst Arkunasha bleeds. The Arkunashan met Osho's gaze and bowed stiffly, sincerity radiating from his features. Shasoviola Shokais Montis, I bow to you. This is a day I have long awaited. It is a privilege to meet a student of the legendary Master Pure Tide. Hmm. Your protocol is immaculate. Still, I urge you to speak plainly. We must discuss matters of military advancement. Time is short. Shavasos looked taken aback for a moment, but quickly recovered his composure. Osho Blink flickered the screen at the side of his command throne, and on the curving screens behind Oblatai, a set of gently curving lines resolved over a map of Arkunasha. Our vectors of approach are clear. The orcs have put no impediment in our path, so we shall simply land at Biodome 1-1 and make immediate rendezvous. I await your arrival with hope and a clear mind. It is said you are Master Puretide's brightest pupil. The orcs have been largely inactive since our withdrawal into the Biodomes, but we know the locations of their bases. With your famous inner light illuminating our way, the path to victory will soon become clear. Osho frowned slightly, but he did not reply. He could feel a dangerous heat building in his chest, a hunger for the conflict to start. The idea of deliberate inactivity chafed at his soul. It is a shadow upon my honor that not all of our people will be able to properly celebrate your arrival. He made the gesture of conciliation. For the sake of the greater good, observe no more formality, Shavastos. Snapped Osho. This is a war. Though by all accounts you are no longer fighting it. Those stranded in the outlying biodomes are starving. An estimate suggests the orcs outnumber us by 398 to 1. So my officers tell me, Commander Sho. Your tone indicates disagreement. Said Osho. His voice edged with warning. I offer contrition, Commander, but our aircast pilots believe the ratio you mentioned is worsening daily. Perhaps, O oh patient one, your orc visitors have hidden auxiliary forces within their asteroid craft. That was my conclusion too. Yet high orbit drone scans reveal no additional life signs emerging from their asteroid bases. You have another theory, perhaps. My primary Earthcast advisor, Fio Vesa, believes they are reproducing. Or still, our readings indicate they are slowly increasing in stature. Osho sighed, heavily. The Tau had encountered the Orcs before, but they are a long way from understanding them. The notion of a foe that grew stronger the more you fought it was unsettling indeed. Constructive stalemate is of no use against these pests, Shavastos. The code of fire is clear. The orcs must be either quarantined or annihilated. We should scour them from Arkanasha for good. Ideally so, replied Shavastos, nodding sagely. Though their numbers are too great for my cadres to meaningfully affect. If anything, it is the orcs who are quarantining us. For now. I cannot guarantee a swift resolution to this war, but I do know that further delay will only worsen matters. We must act. Test the metal of this horde and find its weak spot. It was said that the orcs lived to fight. They were not alone. A part of Osho yearned for the clamor of war, the thrill of battle, the spilling of blood and the exhilaration of the righteous kill. The urge to do violence resided within him coiled like a slumbering worm. The light of every new sun throws shadows of its own, muttered Osho under his breath. I beg repetition, Commander. We hope to turn the tide in our favor very soon, Commander Shavastos. 
interrupted Brysword smoothly. Is there any additional information you have to impart? Ah, yes. The Arkanashian storms. They are unpredictable in the extreme, far more so than you may have been briefed. They have been seen to change direction without warning, snatching up those who stray too close. However, I believe them to be nothing more sinister than a quirk of meteorology. An interesting choice of words, said Osho, his eyes narrowing. The Arkanashian commander's posture stiffened slightly, and he glanced away at something the holographic drone could not see. Osho noted it as a point for later pursuit. I simply mean to say it is wise to give these phenomena a wide berth. Elvesa has devised an optimum formula for dispersal. At this, the hologram Shavastos tapped a finger on the cuff-mounted control node. Almost instantaneously, data spooled across the curved screens behind Oblatai's domed head. I assume your cadres are busy re-establishing supply lines, Commander Shavastos. We are making every attempt, Honored One. My sub-commander Tudor Shakanthas is striking hard and then withdrawing before retaliation. Osho scowled involuntarily at the name. Memories of the training dome regimes rose unbidden. So many cycles ago now, but the scars lingered on. Ultimately though, the presence of so many orc aircraft denies any chance of large-scale resupply. To move even a single supply ship into place has been to attack a Vespid nest. Until today, of course. As he spoke, the Arkunashian commander smiled ever so slightly. In that single facial tick, Osho saw the commander's desperate need to believe in imminent salvation. This is not a war that can be won with open confrontation, commander. We will break them using the weapons of the mind as well as the gauntlet. A lesson Master Puretide was keen to impress upon me. Osho nodded. Shavastos made the curled finger of question yet to come. May I ask you to expound, Commander? Osho rose from his command throne. He walked to the edge of the row of delegates and turned back, padding with perfect balance up the slender span of the white alloy curving over the seating bay, stretching up to the ornamental spars above. He took down one of the cross ceremonial swords that crested the top of the bridge. The commander leapt off the span, his cloak billowing out. As he landed in a crouch atop his command throne, he punched the sword point down, right through the seat's cushioned arm. The assembled officers watched in shock as Osho wrenched the hilt from one side, the snap of his blade startlingly loud in the awed silence. The way of the broken sword. Divide and slaughter. Arkunasha. The red waste approached in the horizon as a show stared. The rust filled waste home to the domed colonies of the Tau were under attack. The orcs. Ones whose brutish ways rejected the wisdom of the greater good had to be annihilated. A task assigned to the student of Pure Tide's teachings. Thinking back to those cold months upon Mount Kanji, filled Osho with equal parts of reminiscence and dread. The training had been by far the most brutal and draining experience of his entire life. A battle for survival against the freezing elements and the mountain leopards that stalked its steep slopes. There were others alongside him. Case and Shasera, warriors of unprecedented abilities. They were given scars that would be with them forever. Memories of a cold so bitter it would haunt him in the night. And not just their bodies were tested. Their minds were filled with the greatest teachings and wisdom of the greatest Tau warrior and strategist the Empire had ever seen, Master Pure Tide. The Mont Car. The assassination assault became Osho's specialty, reflecting his own inner desire to end the battle in a quick, decisive strike. Osho left a different being, honed like a whetstone to a blade his body and mind the best of what Tao doctrine could offer. 
Something to be tested in the war brewing over the rust plains of the hellscape Arkunasha. Shavastos, leader of the garrison, welcomed the pupil of Pure Tide with a reverence that spoke of an underlying desperation. Domes that housed the Tau colonies had been under siege for months, years even. Food and resources were running low as the malnourished people begged for salvation. Osho felt for them. He was going to save these people. It was his duty, his role as the protector of the greater good and his people. The orcs outnumbered the Tau forces by hundreds to one. The very advantage of the Tau's long-range weapons were mitigated by the strange conditions of this world. Ghost storms, some had whispered, appeared to seep into the clashing battles between the two sides. Razor winds that cut even through Tau armor, tearing all sides to ribbons in their wake. An almost ominous behavior to them causing paranoia in the Tau ranks. Besides the old veteran and previous superior Oblatai and Osho's own pupil Brightsword, the commander prepared his strategy. The Mont Car, the assassination. Osho had studied these orcs, saw how the loss of their leadership led to brutal infighting. Cut off the head and the body dies. A plan that had been put into action immediately as the hordes of greenskins came charging across the dunes. The prospect of battle with new arrivals like a moth to a flame. The guttural wave of noise shocked or shown. A tide of undisciplined orcs unlike anything it ever witnessed in person before. The Tau guns boomed. Tasma beams roaring into the oncoming horde. As Osho and his battle suit Kadra roared into the air. Popping the heads of the larger orc leaders. Osho, Oblatai. Brightsword and Shavasso slammed into the orc lines, greenskinned bodies tumbling and breaking apart in arcs of brilliant cobalt light. The brute's attempt to surround him was futile, Osho using his ability to expand his perception to two points. The unique lessons of Mount Kanji used a deadly effect. Greenskin leaders were burst and sliced apart, until Brightsword made a dash for the warlord himself. The duel a clash of primitive orc machinery versus sleek Tau ingenuity. But the orc's raw ferocity was like a tidal wave. The warlord leapt forward, grabbing the flight suit and shredding it to pieces. As Osho saw to his horror, flecks of blood leaked from the gaps. Osho dived in, saving his pupil at the last second as munitions and orcs clawed at them. Osho stared back, seeing the mountain of orcs dead and how it meant nothing. In fact, it only energized the growing horde. The orcs began to pour over Tau ground defenses, the sight unleashing a rage like acid in his veins. His strategy had failed, and Osho knew it. His tactics had only brought vitality to the enemy, and in turn had brought the battle to the doorstep of the Greater Domes. Retreating to the Council's chamber, the senior Tau gathered, a meeting held under the sway of the ethereal Aun Tal, his very presence spreading awe and nervousness throughout all present. The decrying came immediately, as many voiced their admonishment of Osho and his actions. Shavastos, Brightsword, and even the veteran Obatai voiced their support, only to be cut off by an unguarded outburst by Osho. The behaviour before an ethereal utterly shocking. Guilt washed over Osho, his unkindness to his friend Obatai, the failure at the battle and now the dead Tau lies on his shoulders, and his behaviour. But then true despair consumed him, as Aun Tol told him he had failed the Tau Var today, and he was to be removed from the Cast Council, banished to fight in exile to the northern wastes. Osho left disgraced, but his mind still wandered about their enemy. He had made a mistake, so he needed more information to make the right choice, to form a strategy that would lead to victory. Inside the medical bay, Osho and Obatai strode. The pristine conditions a stark contrast to the storm raging dust dunes of Arkunasha. Upon a great slab of ravaged body of an orc, Osho had Percy taken from the field of battle lay. The flat smile of Ovesa unnerving them. The unorthodox reputation of the Earthcast scientist, 
known even to them. Osho had come to study, to understand better the weaknesses of their foe, even as the sight of machinery unnerved his friend Oblatai. Up close, the monstrous muscular form of the orc was imposing. Such brutish strength, with a savage mind. Electrical stimuli test-shocked the corpse, despite the fire cast warning. And then, to their horror, like Frankenstein's monster, a roar bellowed from the now-moving greenskin. Red eyes glared at Osho, as the wild beast lunged at him, an arm grabbing Osho by his neck, the light fading as he heard a chorus of orders yell from Ovesa start to fade. Oblatai slammed into the brute, as Osho drew his ceremonial bonding knife and stabbed viciously. The orc roared and slammed Oblatai away. Osho struck and pummeled the orc until he too was thrown across the room, his ribs breaking upon impact. Drawing from the surgical tolls around him, he charged again, slashing and gutting the beast putting it back into the rest of the grave. Calm returned, until Osho looked over to his friend, his bonding knife sticking out from his chest. He was going to live, he told him, but Obatai met his friend's gaze one last time, ushering with the last of his strength. Sho, you must keep your focus. We must rise above the beast within. The old veteran's body collapsed to the floor, his blood staining the sacred bonding knife, a sight that would haunt Osho forever. White, hot rage, a knuckle-clenching fury so deep swallowed Osho. Why didn't he follow the ethereal's orders immediately? If he had left when he was supposed to, Obatai would still be alive. So much blood was literally and figuratively on his hands. He forced himself to think to wallow in the mistake since his arrival upon Arkunasha. To the hangar bay Osho strode, preparing to ride out to the waste as promised. If he could learn more about the enemy, he would do so. And if this mission cost him his life in the service of the greater good, so be it. But deep down, he knew he also felt a desire to slay some greenskins. Gone was the livery of the violin pattern, in his place, a deep crimson dawned his battle plate, and like how his bonding knife was stained with the blood of a friend, his armor would be stained with the color of blood, an honor to the dead of Arkunasha, a reminder for the price of failure. They had been drained of blood, an odd feature Osho noticed as he stared down upon the orc corpses. The ghost storms, the strange tornadoes of death that had plagued both sides. The rumors and information Osho had found had been suppressed by the ethereals. Something he did not question, even as he felt an anger rise within. Osho returned from the wastes, piles of all corpses left in his wake, the victim of a rage that needed to be vented. To the scientist Ovesa he turned. Even as he felt a resentment for his part in the tragic death of Oblatai. Compiling the information together, it became clear. These ghost storms were not a phenomenon, they were weapons. A relic of the world's previous inhabitants to drive off the orc menace. Weapons drawn to bloodshed like thirsting predators. Clarity hit him like a wave. This was a center on which he could turn the tide of this war. He had made mistakes, but failure can often be the greatest teacher. It takes more than just to regurgitate wisdom, the lessons of pure tide. It had to be lived. Osho, the warrior in the crimson suit, returned. To the caste council and officers he strode, the planet's salvation in hand. On a day to Hololithic he showed the savage, but yet brutal orcs. In unison, 216 Mont cars roared from the sky. The orcs mechanics and mech boys were picked off, the roaming hordes grinding to a halt as their mismatched machines broke down. The parameters of orc leadership were expanded, as long-range cadre snipers and battlesuits began bursting the heads of thousands of orcs. The infighting began immediately. A mosh pit of violence and blood that drew in titanic storms of razor wind and sand. 
tornadoes of death began to ravage the infighting orcs, the death count rising by the second, leaving piles of greenskin corpses drained of blood, everything going according to Osho's design, every action and reaction perfectly accounted for, almost like he had predicted the future. The fire cast officers and cast council stood in awe, stunned by the mounting victory against the foe that had harassed, killed and starved their people for years. Commander Sho of the fire cast, said Aun Tal, you've opened our eyes to a new way of defeating the orc menace. You clearly not only understand the minds of these beasts, but you can also predict their behavior. For this prescience you may stand up not as Osho, the inner light, but as Oshova, Commander Farsight. A burning well of pride filled Oshova's chest as he felt humbled by the honor bestowed upon him. The people of Arkunasha now had hope, all turned to see the Tau donned in a red battle suit, the one worthy of the hero's mantle. Over the dunes, the last true cohesive horde charged towards the last dome. Many of the orc leaders were dead except for the toughest git of them all, the warboss tooth jaw. Missiles and plasma beams roared across an open dune, awash with the blood of greenskins and tau. Screaming ramshackled waves of orcs met the disciplined cadre lines of the fire cast as the battle suits of Shavastos, Brightsword and Commander Farsight teams launched from the sky. Farsight focused himself, triggering fire solutions and punching plasma strikes through orc infantry and walkers, the scarlet suit standing out in the contrast of the forces of the other Tau, but matching the blood-soaked sands. The shedding of blood had its intended effect, as from the sky great tornadoes of razor wings began to descend onto the field of battle. The smaller man-sized foe and allies began to lose their footing, the currents beginning to obscure the fields, jamming communications, but through the winds, Farsight saw a giant scaled quadrupod charging towards him. Plasma and artillery joined Farsight as they peppered the beast with munitions until blood erupted from its sides and it crashed down. A smile crept across Farsight's face. He knew deep down that he was enjoying this. Toothjaw and the orc elders would be close. He could feel it. But the storm kept growing to a level he had never seen before. The confidence Farsight had been riding started to waver. Their strategy had been working, but the repeated Mont cars were costing lives and precious battle suits. Pushing through, Farsight saw them. The Orc Elders, chanting in their foul tongues as motes of white light and green sickly energy shone from their eyes. Farsight drove forward, now alone as an army of one cutting down dozens of orcs in his path. But the green sickly light from the elders was spat at him, his suit gored by the devastating strike as he tried to desperately dive to safety. The system of his suits began to shut down as his greatest weapon became his tomb. He ejected himself, his bare skin now at the mercy of the storm. Farsai squinted his eyes and dropped low his skin bleeding from thousands of tiny cuts. He pushed the fear down and moved forward. He screamed into the storm in rage, but found only a silhouette charging him. Buzzing disc swords dimmed in the storm's gale were coming down upon him, ready to end him until he dived back. He found himself hitting something solid. Through his sore eyes he looked up and saw a battle suit with an open hat. Get in, old friend. We have kills to make. A mechanized voice boomed. Oblatai, or what had been salvaged from the now dead veteran. An AI, created from a download of his brain by the Earth car scientist Ovesa. What choice did Farsight have? It felt wrong. This AI wearing the persona of his dead mentor and friend. Yet he found himself falling into step with the ghost of his friend he had trusted with his life, the one whose blood still stained his bonding knife. Tooth Joy emerged from the storm, the silhouette now in terrifying clarity. The duel began in a brutal clash as the enormous warboss took on the might 
of Farsight and Obletai together. The guns were slashed and broken, forcing Farsight into the style of the broken sword. Hand to hand combat. The battle suit was hacked to pieces until Farsight threw up his shield, using the projected energy to smash the head of Toothjaw from his neck. Farsight roared in triumph, summoning the remaining hunter cadre to his side and forming a testudo of defiance, marching as one from the boundaries of the storm, holding each other tightly against the gale winds. The orc horde had been defeated. The battle had been won as a relief of supplies finally flooded the besieged Tau domes. For over a decade the war in Arkunasha continued. The severely outnumbered Tau fighting back at the head of their hero, donned in a crimson battle suit, Commander Farsight. The tide of the war leaning towards a Tau victory. Battle after battle Farsight fought compiling his notes into a compendium of the beast, military code for all Tau to use against future wars against the orcs. Oshova had become a different person, evolved, refined, but after a decade, news came that shook Farsight to his core. The reinforcements he had waited for, ones that could finally give him the push to scour the orcs, did not come. Descending from the rampart came a single ethereal, one declaring the evacuation of all Tau on Arkunasha. The ethereal council had decided to abandon this world. He didn't understand. Farsight was speechless. They were so close, he wanted to scream, to demand answers to why, but that wasn't his place not within the confines of his caste. After a decade of war against the Greenskins, Farsight returned to the core Sept worlds. A veteran, a name spoken with reverence as a great defender of the Empire and the greater good. A commander required for the war that was coming to the Sept world of Dalith. An empire and foe on a scale the Tau had never encountered before. The Imperium of Mankind. Planets on the edge of Tau space, once inhabited by humans had been shown the truth of the greater good. And now the Imperium had come back in vengeance. A war unlike anything they had seen before was heading towards the core of Tau space. A war that called for the hero of Arkunasha, Commander Farsight. It is typical of the Imperial mindset to trust in strength alone. I myself fought a flightless battlesuit equivalent, clad in armor thicker than an orca's hull. It was powerful indeed, but slow to maneuver. Seizing the opportunity, Farsight Eye flicked the hollow to show drone captured footage of Braystorm's triumph over the Imperial Walker. He complemented it by adding scenes of battlesuits blasting holes right through the torso of Imperial shock troops. They are resilient, these space marines, but they can be killed. Equip your suits with plasma rifles and fusion blasters wherever possible. As a guideline, anytime you face Gwei Roncha, treat them not as infantry, but as squadrons of enemy tanks. He paused a moment to let the concept sink in. We have the right weapons to overcome these warmongering trespassers. We are gathering knowledge of their weaknesses. There is no reason why we cannot repel the humans within a few rota of focused effort. A chorus of approval filled the auditorium, many of the firecast officers making the sign of unalloyed assent. The efforts of Commanders Brightsword and Bravestorm thus far have been exemplary. As a result, recent aircast sweeps have confirmed that the Gwei Roncha have been repelled from Gelbrin City. At this, cheers filled the hollow theatre. On the balcony, Aundressia inclined his head in a subtle gesture of disapproval. Farsight made the lateral line of silence, and his fellow officers fell still. They have been repelled, for now. But a new attack gathers outside Gelbrin in force. We have slowed it down with missile strikes from the hills, hunted and put down their outriders with overlapping sweeps of our stealth teams. But the main body remains intact. 
and still numbers in the tens of millions. A pulse of pain twitched in his lungs at the thought, making his eyes widen involuntarily. He saw a shadow of concern across the faces of Bravestorm and Shavastos. They had learned to be perceptive over the years. We must study them, stall them, break them apart, and then... Farthai's breath caught in a moment. And then bring down the sword. They have great numbers still to commit, in orbit as well as planet side. Yet we have an entire empire to draw upon, able to focus its efforts fully on the conflict at hand. The holograms behind Farsight showed the wider Tau Empire. Its space lanes highlighted gold. Assets were inbound from a dozen worlds. We will observe the Imperial Army's strengths, exploit its blindness, optimize our countermeasures and defeat it beyond question. The killing blow will fall again and again until this new chapter in the ascendance of the Tauvar is lit with glory. The footage behind Farsight showed a hundred battlesuits ascending from a crystal blue sky, sunlight glinting from every burnished plain. They opened fire in blistering unison. The atmosphere in the room was tense with a thrill of anticipation, dry tinder waiting for a final spark. A voice cut through the jubilant atmosphere like an ice-cold knife. An athletic female warrior emerged from the iris door at the far end of the hollow theatre, tall and proud. Her sleek head was crested with a red scalp lock that trailed behind her like a whip, the bands upon its symbols denoting a major military victory. There were many, many bands crowning her smooth pate. Commander Shadow Sun had arrived. Farsight felt his nerves jolt as his former teammate Shadow Sun emerged into the light. Despite the bulk of her signature XV-22 stealth battlesuit, she loped down the centre of the hollow theatre with the grace of a hunting cat. Her scalp lock had even more honorific bands than he had seen in the last watercar stills. Behind her came an entourage, three specialist drones and two chassoui. Their own battlesuits compact but imposing. Farsight noticed whiffs of steam emanating from her fusion blasters, still cooling from some recent engagement. Even O'Shera was not unscrupulous enough to have fired them just before her grand entrance just for effect. At least, not the Kaoyun Shas he remembered from Mount Kanji. Every one of the officers in the Hololith had turned to look at the visitor in their midst. Whispers of surprise rustling through them like a wind through a field of crops. The breach of etiquette was quickly forgotten, washed away by Shadow Sun's awe of sheer confidence and self-belief. She strode up to the command dais and imposed herself between Farsight and the audience, standing head and shoulders taller than him in her battle suit and largely blocking him from sight. Farsight looked up at Andresia, his blood uncomfortably hot in his veins but the ethereal merely made a gentle beckoning gesture to proceed. Commander Shadow Sun, this is an unexpected pleasure. Please take a seat. My address is almost complete. Osha Sarah ignored him. The time for talk is over, she said without turning, her stern tones cutting the last of the audience's surroses into silence. Optimized Koyon plans have long been in place upon Dalyith. We should enact them not stall in order to devise more. Our people are dying, so now we act. As of this moment, the fire-cast reserve cadres join those in the field. Farsight heard not a single voice raised in contradiction. He looked to the holograph display behind him, but it was blank. All focus was on Shadow Sun. The fire-cast is the current target of these Imperial shock troops so we shall relocate into less populous areas, lure them into traps that minimize collateral damage. We wage a mobile war, following the planet's rotation so that we remain on its dark side at all times. A few mutters of assent came from the audience, dotted with louder outbursts of approval. We engineer confusion. We draw the enemy out. Piece by piece, we crush him in our grip. Starflame, you will form the polar point of the pincer to my equatorial. Osarakan, you will perform breaker strikes until relieved. Osora, 
cut some cohesion into the Prayan refugees and rejoin Brave Storm's retaliation cadres at Dal Ryu. Farsight frowned, his outward expression the mirror shadow of the storm raging inside. What did she think she was doing? How could she betray him like this? Their friendly rivalry had turned sour many years ago, and she had been distant and cold ever since, but this public diversion was a new low. The feelings catching in his throat were so intense, Farsight had to force down the urge to cough. Unbidden his hand strayed to the hilt of his ceremonial sword, as Osha Sarah outlined her orders. Gone was the introspective strategist he had grown to admire, the ever patient warrioress who had sat in the snows of Mount Kanji for long days, until her prey passed within striking distance. This was not the shadow sun famous across the empire for her cold and deadly deliberations. Here instead was a paragon of the Code of Fire, alive with the thrill of delivering a long plan Kao Yun. The certain and lethal denouncement of a carefully laid trap. Farsight told himself it was compassion, of a sort, that had driven her to humiliate him in such a fashion. Tao lives were being lost. If she could minimize those tragedies with decisiveness and efficiency, she would do so without hesitation. How their roles had changed. Too much time has been spent here. If any refinements to these plans are necessary, we can affect them over the cadre net as we deploy. Move out. Shadowsun strode back down the center aisle of the Hololith Theater towards the exit, her entourage in her wake. Farsight found his fists clenching as a full half of his emergency conclave stood and followed her out, already talking into headpiece beads to coordinate their forces. His skin burned, and this time not because he'd exited the heel sphere too soon. That will be all, he said to the uncertain officers that remained. I have appended details of your individual briefings via data transmission. We shall combine our efforts with Commander Shadow Sun as best we can. For the greater good, for the greater good echoed Farsight's commanders, but the fire he had lit inside them was no longer there. The Damocles Crusade, the Imperium of Man would call it. The war over Dalith. A clash of empires whose differences were apparent in their iconography, societal structure, and even down to the sleek futuristic architecture compared to the oppressive gothic of the Imperium. Before the caste council on Dalith, and thousands of personnel, Commander Farsight gave his strategy speech. Speaking of his plan to push back these Gueron Shah, these space marines and the Imperial invaders, only to be cut off, interrupted by one he had called a rival, one he had once called a friend. Commander Shadow Sun, espousing a new battle plan. What did she think she was doing? How could she betray him like this? Their friendly rivalry had turned sour many years ago, and she had been distant and cold ever since. But this public division was a new low. Farsight felt his blood boil, even unconsciously reaching for his ceremonial knife. His strategy that he had crafted over the battle so far was destroyed. The fire he had sought to inspire in his troops, gone. Many had come to question Farsight's actions so far, and this was another questioning look in his direction. As the Imperium had blotted out the skies of Dalith, Farsight had been there in Gelbrin City, gaining intelligence as he battled these space marines, who called themselves Ultra Marines. Dueling upon the hijacked rail transport towards the heart of the city, Farsight in his scarlet red suit rocketed towards the transport. Two ultramarines, named Numenor and Kato Sicarius, powered up their own propulsion packs to meet the command of the Tau forces head on. Bolt gun, plasma rifle, energy shield and chainsword met in a concophony of violence. A duel that pushed both sides to the edge of their abilities. Farsight catching Kato Sicarius' Talisarian blade on his shield. But the second his foe stole his attention, it allowed Numenor the chance to go under his guard and deliver a slashing uppercut that launched Farsight off the edge. Into the waters of an enormous reservoir, Farsight began to sink. His heart rate was elevated from the fight, 
his blood singing hot in his veins, but his focus remained absolute. Water began pouring in through the seams of his suit, and it became a tomb. The freezing waters crept up his body as he felt his extremities go numb. He held his breath as long as he could, pouring through his memories of Avesa calibrating his suit over the years upon Arkunasha. Black spots began to cloud his vision as he punched in a manual override. The ultramarine stared back to see the crimson warsuit rocket out of the water, the Gueron Shah angry that their kill had been denied. More engagements came as Farsight, Brightsword and Bravestorm, and the AI Oblatai led the forces of the Tau across the city sieges, directly against the forces of the Imperium and its Space Marines. The almost archaic strategies of the Imperium were a shock to Farsight, as he attempted to gleam all the information he could, as he sought to do what his namesake invoked. Predict the enemy, see the future, be farsighted. But the missile thundering, plasma arcing vicious combat was not without cost, as his pupil, his friend Brightsword, was slain in front of his eyes. An honoured duel he had allowed to happen between the pupil and a captain of the Ultramarines. Grief gripped Farsight, as once again he lost a friend. He could have intervened, shot the Space Marine in the back, but that would have sullied his honour, the honour of Brightsword, and their foe. Yet look at what that honour had cost him. The speech to the Council on the wake of Brightsword's death had turned to ash with the betrayal of Shadow Sun. More news came from his subordinate Bravestorm, who had been left in a critical condition. The storm raging inside began a sensation of hollowness, as an old accusation struck Farsight in his worst moment, an accusation of being Vashiar. To stray beyond the bounds of your caste was a grave accusation. The Tau of Ar, the greater good was built upon the foundations of the caste system. The earth, fire, water, air, and the ethereals. To stray beyond the assigned role of your caste was to threaten the harmonized balance of the Tau Var. Before a tribunal, Farsight strode, headed by a figure that made Farsight stare in awe. The honored ethereal Aun Var, who had inspired billions across the Empire. The assertion of the state of the war began. Here today we fight quite another foe. One that is brutal, merciless, and with technology so arcane we cannot counter it. They are bolstered by unthinking faith in their emperor, a monarchical tyrant that abandoned reason long ago. Their numbers are such that they brush aside their own core Vatra, navy, as if it were cobwebs, and now they land their teeming hordes upon the sept soil with every new day. They infest our airspace, the ruins of our cities, even the commune tunnels beneath them. Their shock troopers are near equal in might to our own battle suits, and they are determined to win at any cost. It was these invaders that established a breach hold upon the sept world of Dalith, under the watch of Commander Farsight. The battle so far had ended in stalemates, with heavy casualties on both sides. Brightstored, and the critical brave storm to name a few. The questioning came just as it did on Arkunasha. Had he not proven himself in that decade of war, yet before he could defend his actions, the true purpose of the trial began. The accusation of Vashiar, Tutor Shah Khan Thars, one who had been his detractor from even his days at the academy had submitted evidence. Speeches of Farsight were projected across the chamber, rousing rally cries that spoke with such passion and an impressive grasp of language that it mirrored the techniques of the diplomatic water cast. An analysis of his actions in the Gelbrin Reservoir, his field repair of his custom XV-8, upon which he displayed unsanctioned colours, was a work of rare excellence and intelligence under extreme pressure. An act that spoke of an earth cast proficiency in technology. Perhaps his actions threatened the harmony of the Tau Var. 
I was about to drown blurted Farsight. Is that how I should have best served the greater good? By letting my control cocoon fill to the point where my battlesuit became a tomb? By letting the wisdom that Martha Puritan had beaten into me sink without a trace? All he had done, all he had learned was not against the Talvar. It was for it. He had not learned these skills to betray the greater good, but to serve it better. Farsight, the orator, the technician, and the disciple of Pure Tide made him a better commander. The silence that followed Farsight's outburst was total. All eyes were upon him. He felt like he was about to suffocate. His breath was coming in short, shallow gasps. The gaze of Aun Var was paralyzing. Farsight felt his body go numb as the verdict came in. Farsight thought he saw something strange flicker upon Aun Var's face as he declared that Farsight had erred, but yet he was still within the reach of redemption. Farsight was a pupil of Pure Tide, and perhaps they needed more of that wisdom to turn the tide of this war. To Mount Kanji, Farsight must go, and using a memory extraction device, bring us the sum total of Master Pure Tide's mind, that we may turn the tide. Do so, and you may yet be redeemed yourself. If you fail us, you will be put to death. Farsight left the halls of the chamber, his ears ringing and his fingers numb. Still the weight of the accusation of Vashiar hung over him. Why? Why did Aunvar choose to look past it? Was he absolved? Or perhaps the fallout of the hero Farsight being struck down in the war against the Imperium was too destabilizing. A heavy burden that began to ebb in his thoughts, as his transport landed upon the peak of Mount Kanji. The pristine cold air filled his lungs, as nostalgia washed over him. He felt the scars, and memory of the ice burns over his body, the jewels with Shadow Sun and Case, strolling past the frozen river. As the delicate snow fell, Farsight carried the device in hand, and upon the peak he saw his master. An ancient Tao warrior, the best tactician in Tao history, Master Pure Tide. It is good to see you too, Master, smiled Farsight, stepping forward and kneeling in the posture of the supplicant bearing his sword. You have not changed, I note. Pure Tide turned in his throne, fingers laced in the gesture of Elder accepting the gift. His face was as craggy and lined as the cliff opposite, deep lines in his upper lip leading to a thin slit of a mouth. Eyes as hard as diamonds glinted under a noble brow. He looked old, older than any Tao Fata had ever seen, but still strong. Time has been kind to you. Monkasho, your bearing is that of the hero. If I have earned that accolade, it is only because of the application of your wisdom. The fire cast would be a shadow of its current incarnation without you. I have trained so many since I took residence here. Thirteen Tausir I have spent on this mountain with the young and the naive, my only companions. I remember them all, every detail, yet you are the first to come back to me. Farsight felt something writhe in the pit of his stomach. Suddenly the contents of the satchel over his shoulder felt heavy and awkward. I had forgotten how beautiful it was here. I doubt that, young warrior. You were never one to forget. I always knew your star would rise high ever since I met you. The war sage's face cracked into a wrinkled smile. A raw cadet back then, but still outwitting your tutors daily at Battle do Montir. One of them in particular did not take kindly to it. He still doesn't. The thought of tutor Shah Khan Thras made his blood sting in his veins. But he pushed the emotion down. That one did not belong here, not even in spirit. My most recent students told me of your victory at Arkanasha. 
a true son of Viola, sitting the storm against the foe, an apt echo of your sept's own trial by fire. Too many good warriors died to the orcs there. I cannot consider it a victory. Do not let the guilt consume you. The beggar are not easily defeated. Their ways are strange. Master, it seems we have encountered an even stranger foe in the Guela. Pure Tide frowned, turning back to the crevasse and closing his eyes. I have seen the fires in the sky. They seem to push a blade of doubt into the heart of the Tao Empire. I will not allow it. So you come here to seek my help. Farsight swallowed. Yes, for the greater good. My soul longs to fight in truth, and yet I laid down my guns long ago. I shall not wear the hero's mantle again. I would not ask it of you, but the great Ethereal's master. They wish to harness your wisdom in as many ways as possible. They have tasked the earth cast with this, as well as the fire. And yet you walk the monarch's path to reach me. You have that within you, the power of one. Yet you must learn to fight with Kaoyon Monat and Montkar if you are to fulfill your destiny. To bait, to decoy, to guide foes as well as friends along the paths of fate. These are the things Kaoyon Shas understands within her soul. But I fear you never will, not truly. Just as she will never truly understand the Montcar. The victory of the mind is to consider the whole, not its constituent parts. Just so. Easy to repeat, not so easy to achieve. Take the Guela invader's mind into your own, my child. Study the stone shape of his thoughts from the ripples that flow from their impact. You must form the Dathlevral, the mirror that shows the weakness. Then, and only then, will you prevail. To secure victory, the wise must adapt. There is little time for study, Master. This is not a war confined to a single world, like Arkanasha. The Guela, their warships come from nowhere. They pour more of their filth upon Dalioth with every new knight. If they win here, they will not stop until the entire Tau Empire is shattered and our destiny cast into the void. And so you wish to win in haste, said Puritide, his expression sour. Just as you always did. No, Master. I realize that patience is key. Yet the Ethereals bade me take a different path. Puritide said nothing, his expression unreadable. The thin, cold rain was turning into tiny flakes of snow, dancing and whirling as it came down around them. Master, the Gawela are here, on this planet. The invader's beachhead is less than two rota from where we now sit together, talking as if I had never left. His face felt hot, despite the cold wind playing around them. With a determined push, their strike troopers could take this mountain tonight and kill you where you sit. Does that not affect your philosophy? Do you not care for victory anymore? The venerable warrior just looked at Farsight, as if the answer was obvious. The habit was just as irritating as the first night he had spent on the mountain. But this time, the stakes were far, far higher. Just as Farsight's simmering anger was about to boil over completely, the master spoke. If I die, child, then it will be because my time has come. And what if Dalioth dies with you? I cannot allow it. Farsight swung the satchel from over his shoulder, releasing the strip that held it closed, and pulling out a disc-shaped cryo casket. He slid a finger around its circumference and it hissed open as he gingerly took out the contents. A latticework device made of dangled wires and tiny circular pads. The device writhed slightly. It reminded Farsight uncomfortably of the Dalithian jellyfish. This is a recording device. You must wear it, Master. It will capture your wisdom. The better to distribute it amongst the commanders of the Talvar. We need your help, and we need it now. So they wish to take my mind. 
I knew this day would come, but I did not expect it would be you that brought it to me. Farsight made the gesture of the unworthy student. In truth, I do not know their full intent, Master. I only relay it on behalf of the Shah's Al Tol. The ancient sage looked sidelong at Farsight, its expression timeless. Do not bring me falsehood, Shaw. The ugly sensation of the commander's gut was getting stronger. He suddenly felt as if he wanted to choke out the contents of his stomach, but clamped it down. I only do as I am ordered, as the ethereals have asked of me. Puritize turned in his hover throne to face his student, his face a stoic mask. Do what you must then, in the name of the Tawa. Taking the jellyfish device and spreading it out with his fingers as Avesa had shown him, Farsight draped it upon his mentor's bold pate with the utmost care. It was a strange reversal for the student to treat the master in such a fashion. In his mind's eye, a memory flashed from the ceremonial ending of their training upon Mount Kanji. The master had finger traced the crown of the new commander upon Farsight's head in a mixture of blood and ash. Kaoyon Shas had been next, then Monat Case. It had been a day of joy. Celebration and relief, the opposite to what Farsight now felt inside. Stealing himself, the commander began pressing the discs onto the neural sites as he had been instructed. All the while, the serpentine feeling of disquiet slithered in his gut. Pure Tide looked up at him, his eyes swimming with sadness and regret. In those dark pools were the reflections of a soul, steeped in decades of contemplation. Our race will walk dark paths one day. Dark paths indeed. Farsight did not reply, but inside his heart felt as if it were shriveling. He touched the device's activation node, and a tiny needle behind it extruded, poised over his master's brain. At the last moment his mentor shot a hand up and grabbed him by the wrist, pulling him close. Do not trust them all, my child. Do not trust them all. Then Farsight pushed the node all the way in, with the faintest of clicks. A master Puritai's eyes rolled into the back of his head, as white as the snowflakes drifting down from the troubled skies. Commander Farsight returned to the capital of Dalith, the engram memory drive in hand, and a strange feeling of guilt from the state he had left Master Pure tied in. But what hung heavy on his mind were those words, do not trust them all. The ethereals, the very suggestion a kind of blasphemy of the highest degree. Farsight had felt anger at the Owns when the retreat from Arkanasha had been ordered, but the idea of not trusting them was beyond insane. To be in the presence of any ethereal was an event most Tao would never experience. Every time Farsight could recall the sensation as one of awe. To question the Supreme Ones was to question the Tao Va, the greater good itself. Farsight strode back to his Crisis War Suit, with full reinstatement, trying desperately to shake the hint of doubt at the corner of his mind. Farsight had ordered his new suit painted red, again to honour the blood spilled by the Fallen of Arkunasha, but in his heart he knew it had transformed. Perhaps it had more to do with asserting his own identity, reinstating his command on some symbolic level, and also his separation from the Kadra being formed, the Swords of Pure Tide. Warriors, implanted with a neural chip created from the scan Farsad had taken from his master's mind. He felt no disrespect for those who bore it, such as longtime ally Shavastos, as it was a choice made for the greater good, but it bothered him. None of these warriors had been there on the slopes of Mount Kanji. None of them had suffered what grueling training he had gone through. None of them bore the scars. It had taken blood, sweat and tears to learn the lessons and wisdom of Pure Tide seared into his mind. This chip had all the hallmarks of a swift route to disaster, though Farsight could not place why. Reinstated to overall command, the clearly reluctant commander Shadow Sun and Farsight now had to work together in unison, as the Tao prepared for their next counter-attack. The war on Dalith had transformed into an arms race, 
Each side sought to gleam as much information from each other. This war would be the crux from which all future engagements between the empires would follow. Though the Imperials, and especially these Ultramarines, had underestimated Farsight and his followers, they were learning quickly. Farsight himself was devouring everything he could, from recordings to hacked comms. Just like on Arkunasha, he was forming an image that came into greater clarity with each morsel of information. Farsight, Bravestorm, and the Swords of Pure Tide held the defense forward positions. As a column of Imperial transports and tanks bearing the iconography of many different units, prepared to attack. But something was amiss. The usual bravado, an almost reckless showing of the Space Marines and human troopers was missing. Almost like they had made the tactical choice to stay inside their transports. No, they had been fooled, lured into the enemy's own Kaoyon. This was a feint. Farsight roared from his position as he pushed his suits to his limit, aiming for the Imperial counteroffensive near the Tau's very own command center. The Imperial attack had nearly reached the heart of their own forces of Dalith. Seemingly, these Ultramarines had used their own information, taken from their engagements, using the abilities of so-called psychers to distort and destroy the Tau forces. A destabilizing factor that halted the onslaught of the Swords of Pure Tide, right in their track. Unable to use the wisdom of the Great Master, who had never experienced war against the warp manifested powers. To the top of a dais, Farsight drew in Captain Joros Numitor, Sergeant Cato Sicarius, and a crack squad of assault marines. One alone stepped forward in what Farsight recognized as the challenge of an honor duel. Farsight took in every detail of the Space Marines warrior that faced him. The creature was stocky, but powerful, half the size of his battle suit, and nowhere near as well armed. But he had seen these creatures fight. They were strong, fast, and determined. He saw the blade in the warrior's grip and the coloration of his helm, and knew that this was someone special. Sergeant Cato Sicarius of Talisar. Ultramarine's 8th Company, the warrior said, as Farsight gave his name in return. Meaningless noise the marine spat back. Then you may call me Death, Farsight returned, his blood pumping and a grin creeping over his face as the two launched at each other. In a blaze of jump pack, plasma, and ceramite, the two warriors traded blow after blow, Farsight's crimson suit reflecting the vibrant blue of the enemy in his face. A killing strike was arcing down as Varsa tried to defend. Flashes of his training at Mount Kanji in the Ice River returning to him as he dipped into the broken sword style. Varsa snapped the marine's blade as his enemy howled in rage. Again the marine came at him, slipping past his guard and ramming the broken blade into his suit's chest. Two feet of jagged metal burst through the armor entering Farsight's control cocoon with a scream of protesting metal. Its blackened tip rushed towards him, a hair's breadth from his eyeball when it came to a sudden halt. Farsight felt the sensation of being in a tomb once more, as his systems began to malfunction. He was moments away from death, until two suits rocketed from the sky. Bravestorm, critically injured but kept on permanent life support, roared plasma into the ultramarines as one with the markings of Brightsword cleaved his way down. How his dead apprentice was here shocked Farsight, but he had no time to digest it, as now the duel had turned into a brawl. He took a moment to think, pushing his thoughts to beyond the parameters of the fire cast, and he thought of Ovesa, ordering an electromagnetic pulse to be detonated from the tower they were standing upon. A rippling wave of malfunction washed over the combatants in an instant, as Farsight felt his suit die and the Ultramarines seize up, the machine spirits silenced in their tombs of armor. Parley, Farsight spoke in gothic tongue, his studies of his enemy frightening even these marines, almost as much as the now crude mercenaries holding blades at their throat. You have inflicted much damage upon Dalith, Scarred as deeply as you fought to conquer it for your emperor. Though I should not say this, 
I respect you for the skill and strength you have shown here. Farsight saw the hatred in their eyes, but behind it the glimpse of the warrior spirit and honor. The same honor that had allowed Brightsword his doom, and Farsight to spare the apothecaries of the chapters that sweat the remains of the battles upon Dalith. Farsight had overheard the comms of the Imperials, enough to know that a so-called Great Devourer was heading towards their home of Ultramar. An evacuation was being ordered. A new priority had replaced the conquest of Dalith. The Ultramarines left in haste. As the Imperials began their evacuation, the war was over. Across the cityscape, Farsight watched as the reconstruction of Dalith began at frightening speed. Already he saw the statues of him being erected, the promotional edited videos of Farsight slaying these Gwiron Shah, the blood edited out, unnerving the commander. He had worn the hero's mantle for so long, but here upon Dalith, the so-called Great Victory hailed as the obvious conclusion of those who railed against the greater good, felt like a lie. Farsight, Shavastos, Bravestorm, the newly cloned Brightsword, and Oblatai three knew how close they had come towards defeat, and that only a distraction had saved the Tau world from falling. Farsight felt victorious, yet served the greater good. Death had almost claimed him many times, but he had looked into that abyss and smiled back, holding his nerve and using his mind to think, to save himself with the wisdom drawn from other castes. But this high was short-lived, as in his quarters the door opened. The force of Alnvar's presence struck Farsight at the first rays of dawn. The sheer aura of authority was overwhelming. It was all Farsight could do to not fall to his knees. Alnvar had come for Shavastos, for the pure tight chip. Farsight bunched his soul into a tight fist and said the words he had been practicing for days. He'd lied to an ethereal, and claimed that Shavastos was dead, knowing that the removal of the chip would almost likely kill his friend. Black eyes peered into his soul, as far as I felt his nerve slipping. A great shame, said Alnvar, turning away. Alone again, Farsight collapsed to the ground, his body thrumming with an exhaustion he had never felt before. The thought weighed heavy on him again, do not trust them, as Farsight became the first Tau in history to lie to an ethereal. How could you do this to us? The Saviour Pods had been remotely prioritised by the Pioneer's auto launchers, with those of Platinum, Gold, Silver and Chrome level given priority alongside the vast, self-contained hangar that broke away from the main body of the warship to carry the machines of the fire and air cast to safety. The rest had been left behind, consumed in the vast explosion that had resulted from the collision of two starships. A third of the expedition lost, and all from the lowest ranks. How could you consign so many of our people to such pointless deaths? Pointless? They gave their lives for the greater good. How can you not see the virtue in that? But they did not have to die. We could have evaded the strike. Do not dishonor the memory of those who have bought us this second chance, High Commander. It is not befitting one of your rank. She made two fists and brought one on top of the other, the lower one turning to a splayed hand as if broken by the upper. They made the sacrifice of shattered jade, costly, but worthy indeed. If it were not for their selfless act, the Guela warship may have turned its attentions instead to this craft, and the next, and the next after that, we contained it. By exposing a weakness, we turned its strength against it, beckoning it to its own destruction. Now we have cut off the wounded limb, so that the greater body may live on. 
And is it right that only those above La rank were rescued? Is it right that every person below that rank is now dead? Unquestionably so. Theirs was a noble sacrifice, and they would have made it willingly, as you well know. You took away their ability to choose? The Tauva demanded it. They died as heroes. The fact you challenge that shows that perhaps your understanding of the notion is not as complete as we thought. They died comatose and under automated control, said Farsight. His thoughts turned to his mentor, Master Pure Tide. His last few years of peace torn away by the mind mapping procedure that he himself had facilitated. There was a palpable chill in the air as the ethereal shared meaningful glances. Then all three looked in Farsight's direction at once. Their combined scrutiny was terrifyingly intense. Farsight pulled together as much resolve as he could muster, and ploughed on nonetheless. I do appreciate that an elemental quorum gave the order for the evacuation to commence, and I thank Commander Bravestorm for acting on my behalf. But I have to say that there must have been other paths to lead away from that disaster. Paths that would not have proven so costly to our expedition. We have lost perhaps a third of our strength, and the vast majority of our basic teams. Who knows how many Kairota it will take for the reinforcement ships to reach us across the other side of the gulf. Reinforcement ships? There will be no reinforcement ships. Farsight felt his mind fall backwards into a blind void. He struggled to center himself, to find some kind of control. There have to be. That is not so. It is not the ships I seek, of course so much as the passengers. I speak of the reinforcements to replace the losses of those La rank. Billions of Tau lives. We cannot conquer these Imperial Ravagers without them, let alone turn the Enclave worlds into full sects. You must find a way, High Commander, said the ethereal Auntipia, her hands held palm upward with fingers spread in the gesture of question with many answers. If the Tau Empire's trust in you is to be repaid, you will find a way. Farsight felt his blood rushing hot in his veins as the import of Antipia's decoration sank in. They were not a vanguard of a large expedition, as Farsight had long thought. They were the sum totality of the strength that the Tau Empire was prepared to commit and every death had brought them a little closer to failure. How could he be so blind, to lose a third of their strength before they had even crossed the gulf? It beggared belief, but it was the fact on some level, Father had assumed that he would have been given access to more resources that made him feel like a fool twice over. How had he misunderstood so badly, and so soon? Tau society without its lower ranks cannot work! I am sure you remember the events of Arkanasha even more vividly than I. Then you will remember that we were on the brink of victory when the Ethereals gave the Great Decree. Even a single hunter cadre could have tipped the balance and made short work of what became several more Tausir of conflict. By hesitating, by withdrawing our command structure, we sacrificed thousands of Tau lives. There was no reason for it. Not that I could discern. Just because you... You cannot perceive it does not mean it did not exist. You let them die! The very Tau we made planet fall to protect! I fought for half my adult life to protect that world, to wrest victory under the most hostile and unlikely conditions I have ever seen. Farsight felt his breath coming in ragged gasps, felt a warning voice in his head telling him to be silent but fierce emotions long suppressed bubbled through his mind. Then, at the last moment, the Aun snatched our best chance of freedom and peace away. To what end? To conserve resources, when an entire planet's population and infrastructure were at stake. And here you have done it again, consigning countless lives to the void. There was nothing but ringing silence in answer. Farsight looked around but saw only eyes cast downward. The expedition's only three ethereals, 
Each stared straight at him with head slightly cocked at the same angle. It made Farsight feel sick inside. I... I offer the deepest contrition. I do not know what made me speak out of turn. Please. He made the clasping hands of the unworthy supplicant and put them to his forehead. Please forgive my outburst. We know that you care deeply about the Tauva, and that is why your emotions soar high. It is well known that the blood of Violans runs hot. For these reasons, and for your exemplary service to the greater good, we forgive you. Farsight bowed low. Should you speak to us in this manner again, whether in public or in private council, you will be exiled forever. A cold fear crept across Farsight's skin, puckering it in a dozen places. You will trust our judgment, now and in perpetuity. In this matter, we speak as one. You will rally this expedition and conquer the Enclave worlds in the name of the greater good. Those who have remained in stasis over the evacuation and recovery phases will have the news of their lost comrades broken to them once their diurnal cycle is re-established, and not before. Do you understand what the Tauva asks of you? I do, said Farsight quietly. He could not bring himself to meet the gaze of any one of the Ethereums. Some iron certainty told him that even had they tortured his teammates in front of him, he still could not have stood against them. We will enter Enclave space before the end of the Tau Seer. By that time, you will have reorganized your military structure and made provision for a new garrison procedure. Complete your work on the analysis of the Imperial War Doctrine and circulate it to your fellow commanders as soon as you are able. I will. You may leave, High Commander. Remember the fate of those in your position who fail to act in the interests of the greater good. The second sphere of expansion had already met tragedy. Billions of Tau had been lost after crossing the Damocles Gulf. Farsight was furious, as that choice to leave billions in cryo-sleep to death had been taken away by the three ethereals accompanying the expedition. From Dalith years ago, Farsight stood before the caste council, granted the honor of leading the second sphere of expansion. He would lead the Tau across the Gulf and recapture the lost colony worlds taken by the Imperium, and bring them once more into the light of the Tau Var. Farsight was speechless, seeing the annoyance barely kept in check over his rival Shadow Sun's features. He didn't feel worthy, even recommending Shadow Sun to take his place, but it was quickly overruled by Aun Var. They want rid of you. The audience chamber froze in silence, staring at the water cast poor Malkor, a somewhat poor example of his cast reputation for deaf diplomacy. They fear the fire cast becoming too influential, upsetting the balance of things. They wanted rid of Farsight, for him to be far from the core worlds or to die a martyr. The Ethereals desperately tried to push past the crude interruption, but the thought hung in Farsight's mind like a migraine fearing how true the blunt watercast words truly were. The second sphere of expansion was amassing. Above the skies of Dalith, the sight of thousands of colossal starships humbling for Farsight, as he felt the weight of responsibility sit heavily upon his shoulders. Billions of lies were now under his care, but with Braystorm, Oblatai III, the cloned brightsword that still unnerved him, and the scientist Ovesa at his side he felt more confident. In a way they were his brothers, his friends. Into the Earth Cast Laboratories Farsight rushed, hoping to catch Shadowson and Kais before the cryosleep was activated, 
these heroes of the Empire staying behind for the future Tau generations. It brought Farsight great comfort, as he was able to find some reconciliation with Shadow Sun. It was melancholic for both of them, the fact that they would never see each other again, and the recent news that Master Pure Tide was close to death. Stubbornness had been Shadow Sun's weakness, as had hot-headedness been his. The two warriors finally left on good terms. Before crowds of thousands, Farsai stood as the hero of Arkunasha, defender of Dalith, and high commander of the Second Sphere, as they launched into the stars. Billions of Tau and Cryosleep drifted across the Damocles Gulf, all except for Farsight, choosing to stay awake as he lived the wisdom of Pure Tide. Study the stone shape of his thoughts from the ripples that flow from their impact. The war with the Imperium had given Farsight much to learn from, just like his time from Arkunasha and his penning of the Book of the Beast. He created his own doctrine, from thousands of hours of footage and data slates, recreating the Imperium's own Codex Astartes from reverse. But this time of reflection came to a sudden end, as ships from the Imperium of Man burst from the warp. The second sphere was under attack, and Farsight had barely a skeleton crew defending the sleeping billions of Tau. Rushing from his post, Farsight headed for Ovasa's lab, arming himself with a new prototype suit, housing the secret Cold Star AI. Farsight barely trusted Ovasa, not since Arkunasha, with the stolen memories of Oblatai and the cloning of Brightsword, but he had no choice. Launching himself into the vacuum of space, towards the enormous gothic cathedral-like ships of the Imperials. Commander Bravestorm, Brightsword, and Oblatai III left behind to stall the space marines approaching in breaching pods. The Scar Lords had come for vengeance, for the war upon Dalith. Approaching the Imperial ship, Farsight heard that voice again, Paw of Malkor, the water cast from the council meeting telling him to find the Gellerfield Generator. Farsight felt unnerved, pondering how this water cart had known so much about Imperial technology. But if that council meeting had shown him anything, it was that poor Malkor spoke plainly. Farsight burst into the hold of the Imperial ship, the Space Marine seemingly gone, likely reaping havoc on his own flagship. Farsight pushed further into the strange and oppressive environment of the Imperial Hold, until finally he reached the Gellerfield Room. In tight corridors he pushed again, having to abandon the safety of his own suit, almost instantly finding himself attacked by guards. Disgusting cyborg human monstrosities lunged at him, breaking his hand as he fought desperately to fight back. Something was very wrong with the energy of this room, Something only confirmed as a rogue hit smashed the Gellerfield device. Almost from thin air, strange horrifying creatures that made Farsight feel sick spawned into the room. Farsight grabbed his head, as every nerve in his body was alight, his mind swimming with pain and torment. Visions poured into his mind, images of a desecrated legacy, of Tau in shackles to masters, and a hexagram shape and creatures of nightmare recoiling from it, all burning into his psyche. Farsight ran, returning to the Cold Star suit, wounded in mind and body, but alive, his sabotage complete. The suit roared back into the vacuum of space, as a creature of metallic avian wings chased his tail. It defied all knowledge and sense, seemingly resistant to conventional weapons fire. Timing his movements to a blast from the massive warships, he obliterated the winged beast, but leaving himself adrift in space. He felt the air leave his lungs, and the black spots on his vision bring the darkness. But Farsight awoke. He lived. His daring void sabotage destroying the Imperials with their Gellerfield failure, only for Farsight to learn that the dying vessel like a primitive, had rammed the Tau flagship in his death cries. The High Commander had been out of action, 
when the Ethereals had stepped in, ordering the awakening of those in the upper ranks to the other ships, leaving billions to die. Farsight made his fury obvious, the act of shouting at an Ethereal unheard of in Tao history. But the blood of those he failed was on his hands, a grief so deep it overpowered his reverence for the Aun's presence. That anger crept up again. The abandoning of Arkunasha, the accusation of being Vashiar, Pure Tide's warning, and the fact that no reinforcements were coming. The Violin's hot blood roared as he screamed, You let them die! A shame he quickly regretted. The Tau Var. Thoughts of the greater good brought him back, and the shame of his outburst. Farsight left the Council of Ethereals, something within fundamentally shifting as his once reverence for the Ethereal caste began to die within. He had fought bravely, but again he had acted alone as his master Pyotite had scolded him before. It would be something he would have to correct as finally the Farsight expedition reached the colony world of Viola. Once the farthest reaches of the Empire, now reclaimed by the oppressive Imperium and its allies the Adeptus Mechanicus. The sight from the volcanic, searing hot surface of Violar shocked and enraged Farsight. Millions of captured Tau and human sympathizers, all fed into great lava furnaces as fuel for the crude Mechanicus machinery, shackled Tau and humans slaving away in factories. The vile message of the Imperium was clear, a torture and punishment designed to break the body and soul. The very air of Viola was filled with Tau biosigns, remnants of the people burned alive under the cruelty of Imperial rule. The expedition's force was outnumbered, many thought victory impossible, but with the reasoning of the greater good behind their actions, they couldn't afford to fail. Farsight was not the young pupil of Puretide like he had been upon arriving at Arkunasha. He was a veteran of decades. He had made many errors, failed, and nearly died many times. The scars of those engagements still upon his body. But just like upon Arkunasha, he would use the environment and the mind of his enemy to forge a path to victory. Like his own namesake, he saw the path laid out before him. If the Imperium saw Viola and his people as only as a resource, then he would take away both. They wouldn't resist. The human slaves punished with eternal backbreaking factory work for sympathizing with the Tau. Farsight forces had begun their two-pronged attack, one using the knowledge of his scientist Ovesa to plant a tectonic device in the heart of Viola's volcanic fields, aiming to trigger multiple volcanic eruptions across the world to destroy the Mechanicus power sources. The second was to inspire a revolt of the enslaved humans and captured Tau. But the humans just ignored the battle raging around them, as Farsight forces attacked multiple facilities. The forces of the Mechanicus were thrown at Farsight in waves, no regard given to the casualties taken. Speeches of the Tau Var and freedom fell upon deaf ears as the broken slaves continued their work, even amongst the plasma and bolter fire. Humanity's brutal methods and disregard for life and their environment repulsed Farsight. It reinforced the enlightenment of the Tau Var against this oppressive regime. The Tau forces had wreaked a toll, a mountain of Skitari, but they couldn't sustain it. In their efforts to buy time, with multiple Monkar strikes and the attempted uprising, they were losing more time, and soon the Imperium would be upon this seismic device. Farsight's frustration grew until poor Malkor, the blunt watercast voice, blared from the comms of all factories across the world. 
The speech delivered one of such venom and hate that it shocked Farsight. You are slaves, but you can be free again. You can tear away your chains and use them to strangle your oppressors. Some of you will die. For some of you it will be a blessed relief. For the rest, these sacrifices will buy freedom. Your life of slavery will be given meaning by a hero's death. Rise up against them. Pick up tools. Pick up rocks. Ball your fists and bare your teeth. It is time for vengeance. The screams of poor Malcor were drowned out, as a tide of humanity full of hate threw themselves upon the enforcers and forces of the Mechanicus. The number of dead on both sides astronomical in a matter of minutes. Farsight heard it all in part terrified at the understanding of the human mind by the water cast and his apparent perfect low gothic. Something Farsight had to deal with later as the High Commander in his crimson suit launched his attack. For the Tau Var, as Farsight, disciplined lines of fire cast and roaring battlesuits leapt forward, many of his forces choosing to adopt the crimson colour of their High Commander's suit. The image a display of a reigning apocalypse as the Mont Car of Farsight was coming. Into the caverns he and his cadre descended, planting Ovasis devices as other teams in unison planted theirs across the planet. From the side he saw the prisons of the Tau slaves. Innocents, captured after the Mechanicus' reconquest before the Damocles Crusade. Farsight shouldn't be distracted. But the heat of pure rage growing in his chest couldn't be held in. The cries of thousands of Tau fed into a lava lake as fuel was haunting. Farsight and his cold star suit rocketed into the disgusting cybernetic guards. His gun kicking as he shred the bodies in his path. You must pay, he snarled. The teams of Bravestorm and Brightsword following behind their brother, as more Tau forces joined their high commander in the liberation. Flames and black smoke surrounded Farsight, the smell of sulfur reaching even inside his suit. With a beachhead established and his bloodlust sated for a moment, he planted Ovasis' device, but this respite was disturbed as a tear appeared in front of him. A disfigured marine, with the glowing rune sword, stepped out, flanked by other space marines. The Scar Lords, remnants from the battle after the crossing of the gulf, had warped straight in front of Farsight. The beach had again erupted into violence, from a face filled with gruesome scar tissue, foul guttural words spilled forth, unleashing bolts of flame from the fingers of the leading marine. Brightsword and Bravestorm rushed to their brother's side, as the elite of two empires clashed together. Farsight felt the mind science of this lead marine enter his own, like invasive tendrils, the crackling energies passing through his shielding. Just like before Dalith, the Tau had no counter. From the scar-ravaged mouth vitriol spat forth from the space marine, I embody the Emperor's holy flame. I have the raw power of the warp at my command. Farsight pushing his suit to the limits of his agility brought time for himself to think. Power. These humans had power in their monstrous tide of the war machine. But the Tau had something greater. Unity. The Tau Var. Farsight threw himself away from the psychic marine towards the cages of trapped Tau slaves and he smashed the lock. The Tau civilians burst from their cages and ran towards their oppressors. They were not like the humans. Unified by the greater good, they cared not for their own lives, but that of the collective. They drowned the Mechanicus's forces and the Space Marines in a mosh pit of flesh, beating them and shoving the Psycho Marine down, even as dozens of them were cleaved apart by each desperate swing. Into the lava, the civilians dragged their enemy, Farsight watching the liquid magma flow into the Marine's eyes and mouth. Many times Farsight had underestimated these Imperials, but he pitied those who underestimated the resolve of those who served the greater good. The seismic device had been secured, 
The rest of the Space Marines were slain by Bravestorm and Brightsword, but as fast as I turned his back, a deafening roar erupted from the lava lake. A glowing figure with wings of flames burst from the magma, booming the words, I am fire. The psychic creature of flame swung at Farsight, sending him spinning. He regained his footing, but he had nothing to combat it. The plasma and fire would only fuel this creation. From the sides of the ridge, a voice bellowed out. There is no way you can stop us. We, Tau, are a disease, and we have infected your empire already. Poor Malkor, the water cast. Again, his word shook Farsight to the core, as he heard vitriol never before uttered from a Tau's mouth. Multicolored flames sprung forth from the water cast's hands, lassoing around the Angel of Fire and snuffing out his power. The Psycho Marine struggled, rasping, Release me, demon! With a sickening grin, poor Malkor released its victim back into the magma, a baptism of fire that consumed him. The plan worked. Ovasa's devices triggered the seismic force, so great the planet itself erupted. The Mechanicus facilities were smashed and carved apart by magma and flame. Farsight stood victorious as the last part of his strategy came into fruition. Oblati III thundered into orbit, the AI engram from Farsight's old friend, heading directly for the Space Marines flagship. Farsight was often surprised by the Imperium's cruelty, but he knew the consequences of defeat for the Imperials. Virus bombs. Exterminatus was the last resort. Averted, as Obletai destroyed the payload in the launching bay. The Scar Lord's chapter was annihilated to the last, in an explosion even seen from the surface. Viola had been reclaimed. The Tau civilians saved and the human rebels folded into the warm embrace of the greater good. Once again, Farsight had achieved victory, outmatched and outgunned, his foresight once again integral, and his use of the environment against his enemies, just like Arkunasha. But in this moment of triumph, something bothered him. To the communications quarters he strode, looking for Delacroix. A human psyker and advisor he had come to respect since the expeditions launched. He chimed on the door, only to hear the voice of poor Malcor respond manically. I am attempting to torture Mademoiselle Delacour, but your presence is making it difficult. I shall peel her face for you as an offering to a great leader. Farsight burst in, seeing poor Malcor leering over Delacroix with an expression that made Farsight's skin crawl. He had put trust in him, heard his blunt words upon Dalith, his knowledge of the Gellifield device, his word to the slaves on Viola. He had seen it now. He had been manipulated. Farsight thought to the words of the dying Psyker. Demon. The possessed water cast lashed out with manifest crystal weapons and flames of multicolor. Farsight moved, but found himself paralyzed as a psychic attack struck his mind. He fell to the floor as visions flooded his mind. Greenskins, a horde of chitinous monstrosities, Shadow Sun's hateful gaze, Mount Kanji. Visions screamed in his mind as he willed his body to move. The visions. He had seen them before, as well as a symbol. One he saw beasts recoil from. Farsight broke his paralysis, leaping upon the creature and carving the hexagramic shape into his chest, its last gargled world screaming how the ethereals had killed his master. Ovesa stepped forward quickly, laser evaporating the saliva with an apologetic grimace. Just give him a moment. <laughs> he is coming round. Tell me he is not in pain, said Farsight, fighting to stay calm. He had threatened to stab Ovesa once, when he had experimented on Oblatai back on Arkunasha, but he could not afford to alienate the scientist now. Shh, sure. Ovesa's haptic gloves twitched, 
dotting and sliding as he adjusted the levels of the simulation trickling from his neuroid web into the subject's dissected brain. Suddenly, the old commander's head snapped up, his eyes clear and focused. I offer a contribution for my lapse in protocolic standard, High Commander, and for the fact I cannot accentuate the gesture. Greetings, nonetheless. Shas o viorla, shovas kais montir, in the light of the Tauva. And to you, old friend. The sight of the distinguished officer held like a fly in a web of neural wiring, straining for a formal tone, even with his brain pan open, and his cerebrum cut into slices, made Farsight's skin prickle with heat, even in the laboratory's cold and sterile atmosphere. Given that I am communicating with you at what appears to be normal capacity, would it be fair to assume that our honored comrade, Ovesa, has found a solution? I must return to the Dalithan Theater of War at the earliest possible junction. I fear at a critical moment I have inevitably abandoned thee. He stopped, head twitching as if in spasm. Is he all right? It was not Shavastos that replied, but something wearing his skin. You come back to me, boy. It was a deep, unhurried voice, rich with gravitas. You come back to me, boy. You seek to learn once more at the foot of the master. Farsight took a step back. He looked at Ovesa. The master scientist had his back to him, pretending to be absorbed in his data. Do not forget the lesson of Kanji Yongsho. In adversity, there is truth. Do you realize that you are no longer upon the peak, Master? I do. I have been called upon to fight for the supremacy of the Tao once more, but in a new body. One more fitting for the warrior's art. Farsight watched the slices of the elderly commander's brain quiver within their suspensor field, the tiny sliver wires in each piece twitching, and said nothing. Master Pure Tide, times are dire. We have need of your perspective, your genius. Four worlds are under attack at one time, an all-out assault on dozens of theatres of war. There are fulasso elements of the invasion that I cannot unpick, even with your teachings. Those who seek swift enlightenment, said Pure Tide, weighing his words, should not be carried upon a river of words. Sharpen your truth, boy. Start again. I offer contrition, master, said Farsight, making the sign of the unworthy student. We are far from the Sept Worlds, on the Corwood side of the Damocles Gulf. Then I taught you well. It was ever our destiny to cross the Sea of Nebulas. As you say, yet in my haste to eradicate the Imperials, I allowed the Begel to gain a foothold in our new enclaves. With the humans all but beaten, I drove the Orcs from the Vorak Belt, and then pursued them, bringing them to bay upon Atari Vo. We scoured the Sept Worlds of their presence. There was a heavy cost, said Pure Tide, reading between his pupils' words. Far heavier than the Tauva would allow. Yes. A knife of shame twisted in Farsai's chest. We inadvertently allowed part of their war group to escape. The vanguard of those same elements crossed back to the enclaves whilst we were still engaged, making far better time than we ever have. The Begel race can intuit paths through the tempests of the void. They achieve through luck and instinct that which the air cast does through years of study. So it seems. I failed to destroy them, Master. And now the fate of the Enclaves is bleak. War rages on all four of the principal worlds. Why do you seek out a cold ghost, boy, when you are needed in the fires of war? I am unworthy of overall command, Master. That is a lie. It is not. The inner light for which I was named has guttered and died. There was a pause. Then, the frigidity of the chamber seeming to settle into Farsight's bones. Then the master spoke once more. Elaborate. 
My decision to cross the gulf intercept space was an abandonment of my duty. Upon Atari Vo, I led my cadre into an ambush and thereby lost all my warriors save those of O rank. I have yet to face formal censure. Perhaps the time is too dire, but countless Tau have died because of my decision and not for the first time. I have failed. I must reflect, learn and grow before I can consider myself ready for command once more. You disgust me, Sho. I disgust myself. I feel unable to look at myself in a mirror field, let alone to be touted as a figurehead for reconquest. And so you wish me, or rather an echo of me trapped in the clandestine fire experiment, to take your place? I do not wish it. I believe it is the only course left to us if we are to act on the true furtherance of the greater good. You said not to trust them at all. I took you at your word, and now I do not even trust myself. Given your tone, perhaps you are right not to. Please, Master. I cannot command, not with my mental state so compromised. I must find balance. I must return to the peak. You cannot. That place is empty of all but memories. Another crossing of the gulf would consume you. Farsight had no reply. Do you not recall the lesson of the High Pass? I do, of course. You do not. You have forgotten, boy, or you would not be here blinded by your own myth. Farsight could only look down. Seeking to learn anew the lessons of the past, must I beat them into you once more? Of course, master. Do you know where? I... I think I do. Then go. Go with the aid of the Fio. My host and I will take your place. The Ethereals cannot know you exist, master. Not as Puretide, and not as Shavastos. Then may we be thankful for the wonder of the hero's mantle. I will pilot a reserve XV-8 as the Saznami of this world's indigni commander. Oveza turned back, making the gesture of the challenge readily taken. Go forth, Montcarcho, and find your inner light once more. Think clearly to furtherance. I know it was never easy for you, but you must, for the sake of the greater good. My host and I will salvage what I can of your war effort. Farsight knelt, sweeping his arm out wide with the gesture of the warrior subservient. The crucified, dissected angel of war above him stared down in something between contempt and sympathy. Do not fail the Tauva again, show. He shivered and fell still. Farsight sat cross-legged in meditation, upon the ocean floor of the enclave world of Violos, cocooned inside Ovesa's latest iteration of the Cold Star battle suit. Sleek-bodied night sharks, glowfish and lesser fish swam around him as the cycles of days passed. Hunger had become a distant thorn as his mind drifted into a deep trance. He thought of the bubbling fizzes around him, the planet's vent, Fire and water meeting, mixing into something new. A thought so perplexing to a life born into the strict traditions of a caste life. He locked his thoughts away from the current conflict. The one he had asked the engram chit pure tide Shavastos to helm in his absence. His old friend had been kept hidden from the eyes of the Ethereals ever since the Damocles Crusade. Shas o Viola. Shova Kais Montir, the Tau beneath the hero that was the High Commander, Farsight. He was old, almost rivaling the age of Master Puretide, had been at their last meeting. He had served his role for decades, fighting across numerous worlds from Arkunasha and Dalith, to the reconquest of the Enclave worlds such as Violas, Tenekla, Guevasario, Salash Hay and Lub Graha. An entire generation of fire cars had been raised up in his time as High Commander, 
of the second sphere of expansion. His name was a symbol. Statues were made in his honor across many of the Tau worlds within the heart of the Empire. But now he felt the farthest thing from the hero he was meant to be. Each time he had battled, he had gleaned as much information as he could about his enemy, forming his strategy upon the enormous piles of data and his memory. But he felt that speciality slip from his grasp. He had been lured into a freebooter orc fleet ambush, taking his forces back across the Damocles Gulf to save the Sept world under threat. But it was a trap. A crude orc Kaoyan that had cost him many of his elite XV-8 suit pilots, Farsight barely escaping with his own life, only to find upon his return back to the Enclave worlds that they had been the true target all along. The Tau colonies were swarmed by an enormous orc war. Again, condemnation came from the Ethereals. Rumors of the accusation of being Vashiar circled again. But worst of all, Farsight had lost trust in himself. He was disgusted by his own weakness. He needed to hone himself back into the sharpened blade that had left Mount Kanji all those decades ago. Days Farsight had spent in meditation at the sea floor, building it all into a mind palace. Scraping through every detail, using knowledge he had gleaned from years of working with the other castes. Realization hit the old warrior. He rocketed from the ocean floor. A scarlet warsuit emerged into the air. He had accepted the truth he had known of himself. He was Vashiar. It was taboo. Yet in that mindset it held power. A source of truth that flowed over him. Into a volcanic waste he soared. Pushing the cold star suit through the ruins of a burning forest. The flames licked his suit and began to singe his skin beneath. He felt the pain. The heat within his soul rise to meet his exterior. He launched his suit to the sky. He was a glowing ember of righteous wrath, a phoenix reborn from the flame. To the world of Tenekla, Commander Farsight suddenly joined them out of nowhere, ordering every aircast pilot into the skies to override their consoles and release their propellant gases, forming a wall of volatile emissions, and then igniting it with a blast from his own plasma rifle. A great gale of flame roared across the orc aircraft, burning them to ash, a gift of air and fire. On Salash Hay, he dove once more to the bottom of the ocean, planting a seismic device erupting a tidal wave that swallowed the greenskins as the Tau city sat safely underneath the surface, a gift of earth and water. On the desert plains of Lubgrahal, he ordered the Tau cities lifted into the air as he launched more seismic devices into the planet's surface. The earthquake swallowed the orc forces into a dusty grave, a gift of air and earth. To Vior Loss, the High Commander returned before all the forces of the Tau and all of the cars he declared them Talisaria, the fire cast ritual bonding them all as sworn brothers and sisters. The crimson born upon Arkunasha was worn proudly by all Tau now, as they launched themselves upon the last orc remnants upon Viola. The orc war was picked apart piece by piece, denied open battle and repeatedly suffering Montcar assassinations until disarray and infighting broke it apart. Cleansing fire bombs the last touch to scour the planet their foul influence forever. The second war of the Enclaves had been won. Before the people High Commander Farsight, Bravestorm, Brightsword, Shavastos, and Oblatai Four stood, a brotherhood that bore the hero's mantle in the name of the greater good. A decade of war followed. As far as I chased the remnants of the orcs to their last stand, to finally eliminate the architect of the Sept World's invasion, War Chief Grog. The forces of the Enclave staring down upon the world of Arthas Moloch, a world that seemed to unsettle even the now ancient Farsight. After all he had seen in this universe, the arid surface of Arthas Moloch bore no life. Even down to the bacterial level, it was empty. 
emerging from the earth in sparse places, were the ruins of what had once been an ancient civilization, clearly a culture that had once valued architecture and the hermetic arts. Hexagramic designs were evident in their formations and decorations. It was incredible work, chisels and grafted from a material the Tao had never encountered before. The reminded Farsight of the pattern he had carved with his bonding knife on the demon's chest a decade ago. To the ivory white waist, Farsight and his forces descended. The smell, the limp winds exacerbating the eerie chilling sense of death. It felt like even hope died upon a world like this. Warchief Grog and his forces had fallen into their old ways and had been caught in the midst of looting when Farsight and his cadre launched their Mon cars. Like he had a thousand times before, Farsight and his Crimson Coal Star suit rocketed from the sky directly into the Orc lines in a blinding assault. Plasma burst from his guns as he tore through the greenskins around him, stamping on one skull in a satisfying crunch. The Orc corpses began to pile up when Farsight noticed a strange hum on the cusp of hearing. The blood and corpses of the greenskin and Tau began to flare white. What is this phenomenon Farsight barked into his Colstar AI? But no explanation came. The white energies released and began to coalesce into a disc-like shape. All the while the battle raged around and then it began to rain blood. Farsight felt a familiar sensation tense in his shoulders and shivers run down his body. Mind science. Psychic arts. The firecast warriors rushed to their commander and formed a line the strange crimson creatures began to take form from the drops of blood. Horned, scarlet-skinned bestial creatures took form as multi-limbed blue and pink humanoids rushed from the white disc. The Tau forces held their ground. A new species had emerged in front of their eyes. One protocol demanded be tested for aptitude for the greater good. The coined Molochites were already tearing apart the Orcs, cleaving and ripping them apart with a ferocity beyond even the Greenskins. Farsight felt an involuntary bloodlust rise within as he looked upon them, goading him to fight but he pushed it down. It didn't take long before these Molochites began to charge at the Tau lines. The battle began as Farsight took the first sword blow upon his shield. He shot the crimson creature in the face, only to discover it passed through with no harm. The tower lions came alive with plasma as the two forces clashed. Farsight burst into the air to get a better vantage point, only to stare directly into the white disc. He reeled as once again visions invaded his mind. Imagery of thousands of slaves smiling so hard they bled. In chains to behemoths who dragged them along. Seeing the old and the young killing those who stepped out of line. The homeward of Tau burning and drowned in blood. Farsight clad as a warrior king. Throttling Kais and Shadowsan in each hand. Infection, manipulation and debaucherous images that would scar him forever. The ethereals chanting and joined together in twisted unison. Farsight felt enormous pain in his mind and his heart as he faded from consciousness. The words again screaming, our race will walk dark paths, dark paths indeed. Farsight awoke, the fluids of a healing tank all around him. He had been severely injured, and his heart had stopped on two separate occasions. He ordered the Earthcast medical staff to release him, but they refused their High Commander. They had been given instructions by their three ethereal advisors to prevent him from leaving. The Molochites were like nothing he had seen before. Their abilities defied logic, as if it was primitive and yet also advanced. Farsight's frustration turned to rage as he learned that the Ethereals had ordered the evacuation of the planet in his absence and had left behind thousands. Again, the Ethereals had made the choice to save only those at the upper echelon, just like the fleet battle at the crossing of the Damocles Gulf decades before. Why? 
Why did the Ethereals want to leave so greatly? What were they hiding? With help from the human advisor and Psyker Delacroix, Farsight broke out from his medical prison. Falling upon the floors, he spluttered liquids from his lungs. He clutched his heart as it seared with pain. Finally, he stood, throwing on a shawl to keep his dignity as he and Delacroix strode through the ship. He felt like a fugitive, keeping his profile low as he made his way towards a council chamber. Brightsword, Shavastos, Bravestorm, and Obatai Five welcomed their brother. The sight of the hobbling Farsight one that shocked as well as amused them. The situation was clear. They had to return back to Arthur's Moloch, to save the cards that still fought on its surface, and the Firecast would do this alone. The Ethereals did not approve, and Farsight knew what he was asking of his brothers. They had served with him for decades, battle at its side and all the grueling conflicts he had faced in his life. But he trusted them. He knew they would be loyal. As well as the fact that the Ethereal and Water Cards would spin it as a great heroic rescue when complete. He would ask for forgiveness then. The meeting was interrupted. The three advising Ethereals and their guards strode into the chamber. Farsight seeing how his brother straightened up, and acted with the same reverence he had once felt before the great Aun Wei and Aun Va. Aun Diem, Aun Wei, and Aun Vir walked in with grace. Farsight feeling something well within, but he pushed it down. The subtle interrogation began. The Ethereals were asking about his condition and how he had been discharged. Farsight for the second time lied to an ethereal, but it had felt easier than before. Word had reached the ethereals of these Molochites, and the new orders had turned back the fleet towards Arthur's Moloch. But this time they would be accompanying Farsight and his warriors personally, to ensure the correct conclusions were drawn from the interaction with this new race. Farsight felt the unease bubble up, Correct conclusion. The images swam into his mind. The Tau enslaved upon chains. The retreat from Arkunasha. Master Puretide's words. The council meeting before Dalith. Part of him had lost trust with them, but they were still the supreme caste. He protested. Their lies were too great to risk upon the field of battle. He thought to himself, were they even coming to spread the Tau Var, or to watch him? Maybe even just to use this as propaganda for the Empire. The Ethereals left, Farsight feeling like his hands were now tied. His heart still stung with the pain, as a thought came to him after his long years of service. He may not return from this world. Again to the surface of Arthur's Moloch, Farsight, Bravestorm, Brightsword and Obatai V descended. The Tau Enclave forces assailed from all sides by Greenskins and Molochites. In his Crimson Colsar suit, Farsight cleaved his way to the beleaguered forces, thrumming plasma shots through Greenskins and Crimson Bestial Xenos with flaming swords, until he saw an enormous, horned, black-winged, beast-snarling, muscular-knotted behemoth thrust directly towards him. Blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne it roared. Farsight feeling genuine fear shiver down his spine. Why do you fight us? He tried to answer back, only to be met by a great axe swinging that nearly carved him in two. He tried everything he knew, to gleam as much information from his enemies he could, to form a strategy around, but each new morsel of information confounded him as it broke his understanding of the universe. He saw arcs of multicolored flames strike his men, only to see some turn to stone, glass and water. Impossible. Logic was worse than useless. The ground was soaked in the blood of orcs and town. The dust, howling winds and flame almost overwhelming. Like pillars of hope, the ethereals stood. A rallying point as many Tau forged their last stand around them. Again, an axe-wielding monstrosity leapt upon Farsight, the titanic blow sending him reeling across the ground of the ancient temple. Farsight bade his sparking and breaking suit to rise, 
looking up to see the Molochite cower in front of the hexagramic design carved upon the temple. In the hands of this worn, long lost monument to a dead civilization sat a blade, gleaming amongst the smoke and debris. The old warrior couldn't keep it up. Agony and blackness surged in his mind as he clutched his heart. His breaths were quick and painful as he felt his old, war-scarred body begin to fail him. Shavastos, take command. Thank you, warriors. All of you. It has been an honor. The last words the son of Violar uttered as he pried the Xenos blade and swung it up to meet the descending, burning axe. The blade carved through the axe and hand alike, shattering the Molochite and seeing the black-winged beast reeling. Respite. A chance Farsight wouldn't let slip. As he screamed with all he had left, the phoenix rises. See how it burns. You do not scare me, beast. I have slain imperial tyrants, orc warlords and psychic abominations. I shall destroy you too. The beast retreated as Shavassos and Brysord rocketed again to his side. His brothers had come to stand with him to the very end. The icons inside his suit gave Farsight information he had dreaded to read. The battle had been hours of grueling conflict. What once was the golden shine of vitality was now the charcoal grey of death. The ethereals had been slain. He roared over the horrific sight to see the desecrated body of the Most Holy. He had failed. He had his doubts, but he never wanted this. He had utterly failed. His voice joined a chorus over the calm waves as the Aru Cathar, the scream of a thousand souls, wailed from the town. Farsight began to stand, his mind numb and his throat dry. He spoke out over the comms, baying the Tao to stand. It was slow, the grief insurmountable, but the icons of the firecast began to rise. They would not die here. Farsight gathered himself, remembering his most important lesson, his environment. Use it. He looked at the desecrated temples around him, seeing the wave of Molochites avoiding the statues bearing the amulets with the carving he recognized. The hexagram, the one from his vision, and the one he had carved across poor Malkor's chest. He was about to move, when finally the old warrior's heart began to fail. The Colstar AI screaming alarms of cardiac failure. Through gritted teeth and hunched over, Farth had ordered his men to retrieve the amulets. They were the key to victory. Switch to flame and fusion, Deny the enemy blood for fuel. All Cardas form a defensive line. Farsight feeling his body numbing, roared forth once again. His strategy won favored by his rival Shadow Sun, the Kao Yun. Acting as bait, Farsight drew in the Molochite and the last of the Orc remnants, becoming the distraction. Cardiac failure, imminent Colstar blurted again. Farsight once again drew the Xenos blade and hurl the medallions into the flaring white gate. Ravenous energies burst from it in a flash, as the Molochites vanished into thin air. Farsight knelt, the damage on his suit reflecting the warrior within, as death was coming to claim him. A bellicose roar sounded by the last of the orcs, charging upon the weakened foe. With the last ounce of his strength, Farsight cleaved the orcs apart, but with each swing he felt himself return, something akin to a righteous joy of a hunter's kill well made. Each swing felt better, invigorating. A smile crept across his face as the alarms of cardiac failure faded away. He hadn't felt like this in years. The phoenix reborn, unstoppable. There would be no new life on Arthas Moloch, at least not that of Tau or its allied races. The place was haunted, 
that much had been abundantly clear, and Fazad had already personally ordered to be quarantined in all official records. This world and its secrets would burn. The Tao Empire would take nothing from Arthas Moloch, but for agony, loss, and grief. And the relic saw that even now hummed with potential the back of Farsight's mind. That, and a hundred dizzying implications. As soon as Farsight had returned to the manifest dream, an Earthcast detail had attended him, three stocky medical personnel making concerned noises as they scanned him head to toe with their data wands. They had bustled him into a med suit at the first opportunity, with a display of sycophancy he found particularly irritating, then doubled down on their preliminary investigations, checking and rechecking with their olfactory charms, pursed with expressions of distaste and confusion. He still lay there, now, fingers tapping at projected screens, so as to coordinate the efforts of the battle groups as they withdrew from the Molochite airspace. The chamber's threshold alert chimed brightly, the stone dragon's icon of a vaser glowing over the smooth round arch above. Farsight rubbed his temples, attempting to massage away the tension headache lurking on the fringes of his consciousness. Enter, he said. The threshold door hissed open, and the stone dragon stepped in. I assure you I am fit for duty, O Vesa. That is, uh, what I came to see you about, said the master scientist. He placed the back of his hands in a V-shape, making the sign of the Valley of Woe. That, uh, and the tragedy. It is beyond awful. It is unthinkable. It is. How did it happen, may I ask? A heavy sigh escaped Farsight as he rubbed his eyes. That the celestial caste goes to war of its own volition is known. They answer to no one but their fellow Aun. As is protocol, I ensured the ethereals had full escorts. But when the enemy chose to prioritize their destruction, I was too far away to intervene. It was my failure in the final reckoning. I underestimate the Molochites and their understanding of the Aun's importance. I fully expect Malkalar to be brought upon me and to be stripped of rank as a result. Ovesa frowned. Arthas Moloch was still a victory, in many ways. A victory won at too high a cost, shouted Farsight. His anger subsided, as suddenly as it had flared up, dampened down to a simmering sense of shame. I... I offer contrition, old friend. I did not mean to react in such a manner. Perhaps I am not in a fit mental state for proper conversation at this time. I do not place blame. Smiled Ovesa. Farsight knew those slate grey eyes had washed a hundred atrocities without flinching, each manufactured in the same name of progress. But at that moment they seemed filled only with benevolence. I understand, O uh, The loss of even a single Aun has a horrific impact on every cast. Uh, for the expedition to lose all three in a single engagement, uh, it's enough to shatter the soul. Farsight just nodded, the grief robbing his words. His teeth pulled back in a grimace, and his eyes lost focus, their clarity robbed by despair. In silence the two sat there, the silence stretching between them. I failed, O Vesa. I failed in the worst possible way. The wretched have one advantage over the dead. They may yet find atonement. You know of Purtite's teachings. I have heard your commanders speak of him many times, uh, though I, I would not presume to read his works, uh, as that is the business of, of the Firecast alone. Farsight kept his peace. He had often thought, in those quiet moments between wars, that the Earthcast could benefit a great deal from the tenets of honour laid down by Purtite. Perhaps now that he was de facto commander of the Enclaves, he could make it so. He chased away the thought before it could take root, but it lingered in the back of his mind, scared off by the reflex of conventional thought, but refusing to be banished altogether. Are the bodies of the ethereals in state for their proper memorial upon our return? They are. And do you happen to know if contact has been established with the nearest Aun Artol? Whether Aun Tipia or Aun Tefan have called for my censure? Ovesa shook his head 
not this close to the Gulf. Uh, the interference it causes upon our comm spectrums is uh, quite extensive. I see. Then I will face their judgment upon my return to the Enclaves. There has been no talk of any Malkla, uh, to my knowledge. I would not expect you to understand the rituals of the Firecast, nor to be privy to the decisions regarding it. Is the Cold Star's data recoverable? Your battlesuit and the Cold Star intelligence will be ready for your requisition within the Rautar. Incidentally, uh, my thanks for retrieving that Molochite artifact for further study. I did not retrieve it on your behalf. It is mine, and mine alone. It belongs to the Tauva, as does everything else, of course. Still, uh, it is a potent symbol of your victory upon Arthas Moloch, or so the Watercast claim. I assume you wish us to optimize the blade for further use? I had considered that option, yes. A more fitting hilt and a balanced housing will allow it to interface with the XV-8 gauntlet, giving you a much improved reaction speed. I see. And naturally, in the course of this optimization, you will study it extensively. That process is already underway. Without the ethereals, and with you uh, under ongoing medical investigation, I took the initiative and began the after-action analysis. The sword is a curious find. Uh, the structural analyzers are finding no correlations with existing metals thus far, other than with the medallion recovered by the ground teams. Even then, it bears little resemblance on a molecular level. We still have one of the hexagrammatic talismans. Oh yes, if that is what you wish to call it. I believe, rather than being a, a talisman, as you put it, it is a contra-empathic field generator that disrupts neural waves. From the footage of the battle, it appears the Molochite race find these devices most discomforting. Indeed, I think it may run deeper than that. There's so many anomalies to study said Ovesa, barely containing his glee. Foremost among them, and the main reason for my presence here, is the matter of your rude health. We firecast find combat invigorating, and we fight hard, even when wounded. Farsight shifted awkwardly. The extent of your wounds prior to the second engagement was such that you should already be dead, or in a comatose state post-trauma at the very least. And yet, you appear to all scans to be at the median point of your life, rather than the end phase of a span that has already been extended to extreme levels. These do not correlate with your last diagnostic, which had you at advanced age and a high state of cellular deterioration. The wonders of cutting-edge Fiomed support. Not so. I examined the records from your last stay in our care. There is something else at play here, I am certain of it. Something that happened on Arthas Malog. Let me illustrate my point. The scientist held up his data wand parallel with the floor and moved it up gradually, drawing up a mirror field behind it. Farsight saw his own reflection and felt his heartbeat quicken in his chest. The reflected image was not that of a Tau in the winter of his life, though the lines of care were still there. Though the scars and blackened skin from his ordeal and viol loss still marked him, the musculature, the sheen of the skin, were that of a warrior in his prime. Farsight said nothing, gazing at his own reflection, the face of a stranger, both young and old at the same time, stared back. A face he had not seen for decades stared back at Farsight, his reflection showing him in his prime, not the ancient warrior he was within. His victory upon Arthur's Moloch had changed him forever, and it unnerved him. He did not understand how he had been transformed. Perhaps it was a gift or a curse from those who wielded the mind science or that eerie, strange world itself had changed him. Upon Arthur's Moloch, the Enclaves had lost all their ethereals, a tragedy mourned by the billions from across its fleets and worlds. Arthur's Moloch had left scars on the inside too, ones that made Farsight choose the drastic but right choice. Before Bravestorm, Brightsword, Obertai Five, and high-ranking members of the other castes, he surrendered his command. All protested, but Farsight interrupted, telling them that this responsibility 
is what he had trained them all for. The decades by their side as their commander, as their friend, meant he trusted them implicitly. Something on that accursed world had wounded something deep within, and he had to pull away, lest this growing corruption consume him. Farsight left the Enclave's instability and good hands, sorrowful to abandon his brothers and those who relied upon him. Upon the wastelands of Violas, the Firecast legend wandered, finding a place to rest in his self-imposed exile. Something fought within for his soul, a rising bile that had no release, one he had to constantly press down. It had been a long journey from the training grounds upon Viola, to Mount Kanji, to the war across the stars like Arkunasha, Dalith, and the battle to reclaim the Enclave worlds. News of the dead ethereals and the now missing High Commander Farsight reached the core worlds of the Empire. The now supreme ethereal Aunvar declared a period of mourning for the great hero. Defender of Arkunasha and Dalith, High Commander of the Second Expedition, Champion of the Greater Good, Farsight. Statues and monuments were raised. Video replays of his speeches and battles reigned across media of all the worlds in the yoke of the Great Empire. But in a cave sat Farsight, in meditation, his mind lingering to the events of Arthur's Moloch and those he had followed for his entire life, the Ethereals. The retreat of Arkunasha, the suspected murder of Master Puretide, and his words not to trust them. The Ethereal cast cancelled sending him away. The sacrifice of the stasis locked Tau, the propaganda he had been a part of and even starred in. The Mons Tau, the time of ruin before the Ethereals, and the Fiu Tan, the sudden appearance of the ethereal cast, all things he lingered upon. Now no longer in the presence of an ethereal, he thought to the many orders and actions that now in retrospect seemed immoral. Farsight began to feel panic, to question even that Tao Va was madness, but this unifying ideology had been thrust down his throat his entire life, and it was created by them the Ethereals. He had seen them lie, make those who blurred the lines between castes go missing, keep information to themselves. How much did they truly understand about the Molochites? How much did they keep about the wider galaxy and the universe itself from the other castes? Why did it disturb the Tau Var to be Vashyar? Surely wisdom and knowledge could be of use to all the castes, even Master Puritai's teachings were applicable. Fire, water, earth, and air. It had been the harmony and combination of those ways of thinking that had saved the Enclave worlds. Perhaps there was a greater good that could unite the Tau and many other species together, but did it require an unquestioning ruling class? The very survival and thriving Enclaves were tantamount to that very idea. For nearly a century, Farsight lived inside the wastes of Violos. His mindset, the truth he had uncovered he feared too dangerous to bring back to the greater Tau society. The bile and corruption that he had felt linger since Arthur's Moloch had passed in this peaceful existence. He had conquered the monster within, avoided the monster he would have become if he had stayed. It was peaceful. A life never permitted in the robust boundaries of caste life in the Tao Empire. He could have stayed there forever, until one day Farsight looked to the skies and saw it bloom into a disgusting purple grey above the desert refuge. The cacti and creepers that had provided him with water grew out of control into new horrific shapes. An invasion had come to Violos, something that was changing the substance of his home to better suit its purposes. Farsight felt his gut sink. He closed his eyes and knew his people were in danger. He thought to the visions he had seen upon Arthur's Moloch, of a great devour of gnashing claws and fangs. 
Farsight found his resolve, and knew that he would once again have to assume the hero's mantle. To the cast council of the Enclave, the hero, Commander Farsight returned, to Bravestorm, Brightsword and Obletai Five, who never thought to see their mentor alive again, were overjoyed. The legend Farsight embraced his command once again. Inside the latest iteration of the Cold Star suit, and with Dawnblade in his hand, the Enclaves regrouped and prepared to face this new enemy. The Great Devourer, the Tyranids the human allies called them. Chisna's monsters whose numbers were almost endless. Great, a great bio fleet that swarmed worlds and devoured all the biomass until nothing was left in its wake. An enemy that couldn't be reasoned, negotiated with, or shown the wisdom of the Tau Var. Farsight began, absorbing as much information as he could about his new enemy, seeking to create a predictive strategy worthy of the moniker Farsight. Across all the worlds of the Enclaves, new generations born upon these very worlds prepared to fight for the legendary commander. They steeled their hearts and looked bravely to the skies to see the clouds of gnashing teeth descend. Commander Farsight and the Enclaves met the Tyranid Horde, as arcs of plasma munitions plunged into the biomass of ravenous Chitina swarms. The Tyranids fell in their thousands, as hot burning plasma arced and singed flesh. Brave firecast warriors in turn finding their own armor and skin devoured, melted by horrific venomous weapons. The clashing of armies and munitions filled Farsight's display, in a scene of apocalypse. Even upon Arthur's Moloch he had not seen such raw destructive hate. Perhaps long ago he had conquered fear, but to see the hordes of the Tyranids knotted something within his stomach. To the skies once again, Farsight, Bravestorm, Brightsword and Obletai Five descended, alongside 80 teams of Crisis suits. The Crimson XV8s like tears of blood raining the Mont Cars towards the leading bioforms. Farsight seeking to break the connection to the overall hive mind by cutting these nodes down, attempting to return the Tyranid Horde into little more than rambling beasts. But at every step, the Tyranid Horde adapted. Each strategy and fine tuning of Farsight was met with an equal response. It was the battle of two minds on the grand strategy board that left war a stalemate. One Farsight couldn't afford to keep up, as thousands upon thousands of Tau lost their lives over the many months of the gruelling conflict. It was like Arthas Moloch, this was an enemy that couldn't be fought by conventional means, and Farsight knew it. To the now ancient Earthcast scientist Ovesa, Farsight turned. The two devising a strategy together. The world of Via Loss was to be evacuated. It was a planet Farsight had once fought so hard for, but it now had been ravaged by war, in the process of consumption by an enemy without number. Within an Earthcast facility, with his elite cadre, his brothers and a team of Earthcast scientists, Farsight locked themselves inside, preparing to turn the world from prospective meal into a trap. Eight days the Tyranid Horde ran freely across the plains of Violas, creeping their way towards the entombed Farsight and his men. Finally the monsters had come, their great numbers forced into the confinements of the facility, where Farsight and his chosen few lay in ambush. Bunched together inside, the overwhelming numbers of the Horde were useless, as Farsight and his warriors leapt forward each taking on a duel after duel, as these nightmares creatures did his best to slip through. Each second of time bought was precious, as Farsight and his men piled up the bodies inside the corridors. Farsight himself was soaked in blood, and the Dawnblade cleaved thousands of Tyranids, but the Tyranids kept coming. Farsight prepared for his death, he had come close so many times before and if his century-long existence ended in the heat of battle, it was exactly where he wanted to be.
Farsight peered down upon the surface of Violos. His eyes flickered across the growing toxic cloud that was the Tyranid biomass. He saw it sag with sickness and decay, and the genius self-replicating poison of Ovesa and the Earthcast scientists devouring the devourer. But his mind was elsewhere, as he thought to those brave Tau who had saved the Enclaves. Those Earthcast scientists had volunteered to stay behind, consuming the poison within themselves and allowing the Tyranids to ravage them, a lethal trap that spread the sickness directly into the hive. They had made the ultimate sacrifice for the greater good, an act he had seen many times with the fire cast, but it moved him to see that very same resolve in another cast. It was a choice that showed him the greater good could endure without the ethereals, without their manipulation, without their presence. A society of the collective working in harmony without the oppressive leadership and manipulation. Farsight knew in his heart that he couldn't hide away. He had to protect what the Enclaves represented. Commander Farsight returned as news made its way to the heart of the Tau Empire. Or the supposed return of the great hero, but his refusal to join Tau society. The Enclaves had seceded from the Tau Empire. The name Farsight was purged from the Tau histories. Statues and academies were torn down, as a shame was wiped away by the supreme ethereal, Aun Var. It was a hatred not reflected within Farsight's heart, as news came of the Imperium of Man's second attempt at the Corsep Worlds arrived. The second Agrillian campaign, a defense of the Tau's third sphere of expansion, helmed by the legendary Commander Shadow Sun, looked to the skies as Tau forces donning in crimson red came to the aid of their brethren. The forces of Farsight and the Imperium clashed once again, Farsight once more facing space marines upon the field of battle. Despite his aid to the Empire, the Ethereal Council ordered Shadow Sun to immediately capture him, something she secretly leaked to the exiled commander, a last favour of friendship between the two. Farsight and his forces once again returned across the Damocles Gulf, to find an uprising of orcs. Farsight's an equal past frustrated and excited at battling this long standing foe. The forces of the then Enclaves found themselves surrounded as another foe joined the war. Great fleets and haunting vessels appeared, space marines unlike anything Farsight had seen before plunged its way into Enclave space, ones that offered their service to these seeming gods of chaos. Once again, Farsight took his forces to that accursed world of Arthas Moloch, seeking to draw in the orcs and these chaos space marines to fight each other. The battle was on a scale of destruction that pressed the Enclave forces to the brink. Disciplined lines of firecast warriors held the lines against the rampaging green-skinned savages and the horrific forces of chaos. Even with the lure working, and Farsight launching his renowned Mon Cars against the enemy leadership, they began to be overrun. Tau and their thousands began to fall, once again their blood soaking the sands of this dead world. Commander Brightsword was slain, once again Farsight having to live through that grief and pain. Even Bravestorm and Oblati 5 were critically injured. Farsight began to feel the desperation grow within. He would give anything for his people to live. Anything. Dispatching messengers across the gulf, Farsight offered his own life in exchange for protection and aid from the Tau Empire. He knew the Ethereals wanted him dead, but his offer was rebuked. The people of the Enclaves to them had been corrupted and they would not fit within the Tauvar now. Farsight was furious. How could the Ethereal's hate of him be so blinding? Once again, Farsight had to think, to form his strategy, one that would use his environment in ways that truly disgusted him. 
but what choice did he have? Recreating the events over a century before, Foss had used the blood of the fallen marines and orcs to open a portal. Those Molochites began to flood the enemy forces, but something hot and furious began to bubble within Farsight. He looked to his own men, those that were being cut down and felt disgust. He darted across the field of battle, with a speed and mobility that left him a blur before his enemy's eyes. Orcs and Chaos Marines were torn in two. Oceans of blood ran from Dawnblade, as Farsight kept on killing. He felt such fury and hate with each swing that it threatened to swallow him whole. His mind began to flicker with visions. He saw himself, a warrior king, becoming an avatar of a blood god. His battle suit transformed into a titan-sized, axe-wielding monstrosity covered in the skulls of the ethereals who had abandoned his people. The weak would die by his hand as he spilled rivers of blood wherever he would walk. His teeth were clenched, his rage was apocalyptic, and his mind pulsated with pain and venom. It was that image of a monster wearing his skin, and the thoughts of Pure Tide, of Case, and Shadow Sun that snapped the veteran warrior back to his sense. He felt sick, like something dark had hung over him. He had been drawn in deeper into the mosh pit of violence by something upon this world, and it was going to get his men killed. With the orcs, Chaos Marines and Molochites drawn fully into an all-out war, Farsight drew the Enclave forces back. To the orbit of Arthur's Moloch, Farsight looked down upon the destruction. Something about this world had changed forever like something had been stolen from it. The mutual destruction of the Orcs and Chaos Marines brought about peace once again to the realm of the Enclaves, a peace that would have to be protected by Farsight. His people were now damned, never able to return to Tao society, but what they had built was harmony, a balance of castes, humans and aliens that worked together towards a greater good. It was a society a future that Farsa would protect with his life. To the billions donned in crimson red, they looked to their hope, their protector, their champion of their greater good, Commander Farsight. <laughs>